When we talk about the worst fan conventions of all time, you know, generally a lot of the same names come up. Names like Anime Matsuri, Lost Pegasus Unicon, and, well, I mean, you can't talk about bad cons and not bring up DashCon. Okay, if everyone would like to collectively, like, groan and sigh together, that's what I've been doing, so we can take a second to do that. So on three, we're all gonna sigh together, okay? So one, two, but today, I'd like to tell you about what I think is a massively overlooked train wreck of a con, one that shockingly few people know about, and it's called IzumiCon. Specifically, its 2018 convention was the awful one. The others were great, and that actually made it that much more surprising that 2018 turned out the way it did. Now, I realize that comparing it to the likes of DashCon is a bold statement, but ZumiCon 2018 was boldly awful. Like, just to give you a little taste, a little preview of what was going on, it had a new owner who, before owning the con, came dangerously close to being blacklisted from volunteering at it. And while expectations for her leadership were remarkably low, she still somehow managed to surpass everyone's worst nightmares. Her communication was notoriously awful. Her loose grasp of the con's goings-on caused more than one incident that could have got the con into serious trouble. And I'll get into the specifics later, of course, but everything reached a crescendo only weeks before the event was supposed to happen, resulting in the messiest, most explosive con cancellation that I personally have ever seen. Like, I'm not even joking or exaggerating when I say that this con was at least as bad as DashCon. Honestly, no clickbait, I would say that it was worse than DashCon. Really and truly, I would. This con was bonkers. And yet, outside of the Oklahoma con-going community, there's really not all that many other people who know about this con. But you know what? That ends today. I've spent literal years learning pretty much everything there is to know about what happened to this con from several of its former directors, artists, panelists, and more, so that this story can finally be told. So without any further ado, let me tell you all about it. So, first things first, before we can understand what made IzumiCon 2018 so awful, we need to know more about IzumiCon in general. So, IzumiCon was a fall anime convention in central Oklahoma that was launched in 2007, though you can still find posts talking about its planning that go as far back as 2006, which has caused some mild confusion that it might have started that year, but I'll draw your attention to IzumiCon's 2008 program, which called that year its, uh, two and you will show. Anyways, the first IzumiCon was held at the Biltmore in OKC, then it moved to the Reed Center in Midwest City for a while, and then finally it moved to the Cox Convention Center, which is now Prairie Surf Studios, in downtown OKC in 2013. Incidentally, I went to this con every year between 2007 and 11, and then again in 2017, where I was a panelist. I was also supposed to be a panelist in 2018, but uh, you'll see how that went later in the video. Anyways, IzumiCon was founded by Scott Richardson, Stan Dolan, and the late Marlon Stodgehill. The three had previously all been involved with Anime Weekend Atlanta and launched GE2 and Kawaii Con together. And partially because Kawaii Con's launch was so successful, and also because Scott had moved from Atlanta to Oklahoma in 2005, the idea to start another new convention in Oklahoma just seemed like the next obvious choice at the time. And that new convention would, of course, be a ZoomiCon. Tokyo OK, formerly known as Tokyo in Tulsa, but nonetheless Oklahoma's largest anime convention now almost by default, wouldn't have its official launch until 2008, and while there were a handful of smaller Oklahoma anime conventions like RoninCon and CosCon that happened prior to its launch, there was still nothing quite the size or scope of IzumiCon in Oklahoma at the time, and certainly nothing that was being orchestrated by a group with even half as much experience as IzumiCon's founders. And I'm telling you this so you can better understand just how easy it was for IzumiCon to quickly become a huge hit among local anime fans. As a matter of fact, 
It was getting so huge so fast that rumors quickly circulated that its launch is why RoninCon, which tended to be the local fan favorite anime con in Oklahoma before IzumiCon, ceased operations as it had its last event in 2005, though they were hoping to plan another for 2007 that ultimately never happened. But neither Scott nor the handful of former RoninCon staffers that I spoke to blamed RoninCon's decline on IzumiCon. To be more specific, those former RoninCon staffers said that the con had already been in a visible decline by the time IzumiCon came around. None of them recall there being like, you know, one big specific reason why RoninCon went into decline. Rather, it just seemed to be a series of management mishaps that were never neutralized by a consistent source of income, and over time, everything just piled up. For example, one former RoninCon staff member alleged that overspending on t-shirts seemed to be a consistent problem for the con. In other words, it's sad, but nonetheless extremely likely that Ronin Con would have ceased operations sometime in the mid or late 2000s with or without the launch of IzumiCon. But even though IzumiCon isn't responsible for Ronin Con's decline, it still doesn't really surprise me that people thought that it could have been, and I'm saying that not just because of the timing of all this, but because of how quickly and how thoroughly IzumiCon's popularity eclipsed Ronin Con's despite Ronin Con being the older con. In fact, the former Ronin Con staffers estimate that their last event, which as a reminder was in 2005, had about 250-ish people in attendance in numbers that was pretty normal for them. Meanwhile, there was an estimated 1,000 people at IzumiCon in just its first year, and that number would only continue to climb over the course of the con's lifespan. The con would never attract the several tens of thousands of attendees that you could find at, say, a lot of Texas conventions, and I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like it was the perfect con, but for anime fans in Oklahoma, especially central Oklahoma, it was still something much closer, it was fun, it still had pretty good attendance, all things considered, and the con was generally pretty well liked. But 2016 would end up being a pretty major turning point for the con, more specifically, its 2017 event would end up being the prelude to the beginning of the end of IzumiCon. <laughs> for this whole story seems to have been made with a scheduling conflict. Namely, that for reasons I wasn't able to 100% verify, the Cox Convention Center just wasn't available for the weekend that IzumiCon was hoping to use for their 2016 event. Unable to secure a weekend they thought was particularly better, ultimately IzumiCon was more or less forced to settle for skipping their 2016 event and just hosting their 2017 event in January. IzumiCon was always more of a November event, so obviously this decision wasn't exactly ideal, but alas, that's just what the con's leadership felt was their best option. And in fairness to them, I mean, while the first weekend of January isn't necessarily perfect, it could still be a lot worse. I mean, you know, really the only thing they needed to worry about now was the impending possibility of winter weather, but you know, Oklahoma's generally a pretty warm state, so I mean, think about it. What are the odds that there'd be winter weather at all, let alone specifically during IzumiCon weekend, right? The final round of snowfall is possible in Oklahoma City Friday morning after overnight snow of one to three inches. Snow is possible till around noon on Friday, according to the National Weather Service. A winter weather advisory remains in effect for western and central Oklahoma as the system moves east. Roadways are slick and hazardous across central parts of the state. Travel is discouraged. Several closings have been reported Friday morning, including the school districts of Oklahoma City, Edmond, Middell, and Norman. On the night before the con was set to start, central Oklahoma got covered in about two inches of ice. And, you know, I get it. For some of you, this probably doesn't sound like a big deal and you don't understand why this is such a big problem, but Oklahoma is generally pretty warm and, by extension, not super well equipped to deal with winter weather when it actually hits. But even though all the local schools were closed, for IzumiCon, the show still had to go on. So here was the good news. There were two hotels literally on the other side of the street from the convention center, and even forgetting about them, there's still plenty of others sprinkled throughout the downtown area. So people who either lived downtown or were staying in nearby hotels were still able to get to the con without much of a problem. Most notably, this included all of the con's guests. But the bad news was a substantial 
substantial amount of this con's attendance was local, but not like living in the downtown area local, you know? We're talking people who already live in or close to Oklahoma City, you know, the kind of people who don't need to stay in a hotel room throughout the weekend. In other words, attendance took a pretty big hit that Friday. And let me tell you something, it showed. Several artists and vendors didn't show up, several panels had to be cancelled, including one of mine actually, and you could practically smell the disappointment in the air. Yeah, it was not a good day for AzumiCon. But, you know, things were getting better on Saturday and Sunday, you know, the ice was starting to melt and more people started showing up, and I'm told that although it wasn't as much of a profit as all the other recent years, the con did still make a profit. But that Friday, you know, it was rough. It was really, really rough. And that's probably why the con's owners, Marlin and Faisal of Dyad LLC, and yes, by the way, that is the same Marlin who helped launch the con, decided that something big needed to change. Now let's talk about them for just a moment here. At the time, Dyad was a company that was co-owned by Marlin and Faisal. The company ran Kawaii Con and Comic Con Honolulu, but the two were still involved in plenty of other cons in addition to them, most notably including Anime Weekend Atlanta. It's hard to say for sure just how long Marlin and Faisal had been considering putting a ZumiCon under new ownership, but it's widely believed that the troubles the con had in 2017 is what cemented their decision. It was time to let a ZumiCon go. Or more specifically, it was time to put it under new and preferably local ownership. According to Faisal, simply put, it wasn't fun anymore. These conventions are volunteer-based, including myself, and I just didn't have the vacation slash time off from my actual job to keep doing it. So then, who was going to buy the con? Well, there were a few potential buyers, which included, but wasn't limited to, the con's then head tech director and resident DJ, and for a while it looked like he was gonna get it too. But alas, due to some problems in the contract, this deal fell through, and instead the con ultimately became a property of a company called Ladder Entertainment. Oh, <laughs> what's the matter, never heard of Ladder? Yeah, nobody else at the time had either, but they did know the person who controlled Ladder, the person who now owned Izumicon's name. And it was a late 20-something-year-old former Izumicon volunteer called Dez. And everything up until this point, the venue problems, the ice storm, you know, all that, yeah, that was just the prelude to the beginning of the end of Izumicon. And it's Dez taking over the con that officially marks the beginning of the end of Izumicon. <laughs> Dez had two hobbies that are going to be relevant to this story. There was occasionally volunteering at cons, of course, and also paranormal investigation. Hey there, demons. It's me, your boy. I'm sure it's immediately obvious why her interest in cons is going to be relevant to this story, of course, but as for the paranormal investigations, that's going to be important because foreshadowing slash irony alert, she sure did like to ghost people. Jokes aside though, let's go ahead and talk about Dez's con experience. While I couldn't exactly find a full list of all the cons that she's ever volunteered at, I have still managed to find at least six confirmed instances of her volunteering, and then one more that I'm gonna count for, let's say, half a point that she claimed to own while all the AzumiCon 2018 stuff was happening. Though if I can be totally honest, even counting this one as a half seems pretty generous because all signs point to the idea Idea that making this con happen was never a serious priority. Yeah, in her email signature, Des claimed to be the owner of something called Oklahoma's Paranormal and Horror Convention, but as far as I can tell, that con never actually happened. It had a Facebook page that was made in October of 2017, and I was able to grab screenshots of it in January of 2021. Yeah, I was not kidding when I told you that I've been working on this video for literal years, but at some point between then and now, the page was removed. But at least as of January 2021, the last post was made in June of 2018, but really, that was it. No event ever took place, no date was ever posted, no venue, not even much of a logo really, just nothing. The only substantial glimpse into this con is an email that Des sent with some preliminary planning, you know, things like, here's some ideas for potential guests, here's some ideas for badge pricing, here's the venue I'm considering, here's a few other ideas for activities, nothing concrete. 
suffice to say. But back when it was still up, I tried messaging the con's Facebook page to learn more about it, but to no surprise of mine, well, I didn't get a response. Someone saw the message though, so I mean, there's that, I guess. In any case, as for the cons that she volunteered at, I've been able to confirm that she volunteered at least once at SoonerCon, twice at Anime Fest, once at Acon, and twice at AzumiCon prior to her ownership. Starting with Anime Fest, she volunteered in 2016 and 17 as a regular press volunteer and then press manager, respectively. I was unable to get in contact with anyone who was involved in the con's promotion process, so the precise details of why Dez specifically was chosen to get promoted are still pretty fuzzy to me. In any case, nobody that I spoke to seems to remember anything about Dez as a volunteer in 2016, but 2017 was different, not least of all because Anime Fest 2017 was a particularly chaotic year for the con overall. You see, they managed to get a ton of fantastic guests, which most notably included some of the main staff of Yuri on Ice, which wasn't even a year old yet at the time. Yeah, needless to say, the fandom showed up in droves and the con wasn't exactly a hundred percent ready for them. To put it into perspective, in 2014 the con had an estimated attendance of 10,297 people, in 2015 10,090, in 2016 10,751, and then in 2017 more than 12,000. Said Yadatachi's owner and editor-in-chief Katie Castillo in her review for the con, anything Yuri on Ice related was a hot mess. We went to the first panel but ended up bowing out so that other people could get a seat at others. I don't think the convention had any idea on the size of the fandom and turnout. But to get back to Dez, the week before the con itself, she had sent an email saying that she'd be unable to be there. The official reason was for personal reasons, though she told the con's other directors and managers that it was due to a medical emergency in her family. She therefore gave her position to a friend of hers, who she referred to as her lieutenant. I tried reaching out to her lieutenant to learn more, but alas, they never replied to me. That being said, I did speak to the lieutenant's girlfriend, who alleged that Dez hadn't told told them about any of this until pretty much the last possible second, the literal day before they were going to be leaving for the con and as they were out getting dinner with friends, no less. I was pissed and told her how unacceptable it was at that very dinner, she'd further say about it. We showed up and did what we could and I feel like we did a good job with virtually no warning we'd be doing anything like that. And indeed, despite the rest of the con's chaos, I've actually heard pretty good feedback about the press overall from the press's side of things. So whatever Dez had done prior and her lieutenant and the other press volunteers did the weekend of the event, well, it worked. More specifically, I spoke to two members of Anime Fest 2017's press and both had glowing things to say about their experience. In fact, one of them, Jaden, said about it, it's because my manager and I had such a good experience with A-Fest that we had plenty of trust in the IzumiCon process. Next, there's Acon 2017, where Dez was volunteering in guest relations. To be honest, I wasn't able to find out much about the quality of Dez as a volunteer, but one anonymous volunteer, who I'll call A, alleged about Dez that, quote, she didn't do her job at all. I was in the main guest room helping the guests who wanted to rest in between their different events. Dez was late or sometimes never showed up for to help her guests or anyone else. But for as bad as that is, it wouldn't even be the worst claim I'd heard about Dez at Acon 2017. Both A and a former friend of Dez's who was at the con alleged that it was here that Dez had offered a certain man sexual favors from A without A's consent and that A quickly reported this to the con and that it resulted in Dez getting banned from volunteering at Acon. Possibly at all, or possibly just within guest relations. I reached out to Akon directly to see if they could tell me more about this, but they told me that unfortunately, they had no surviving documentation from the time. An anonymous member of the convention with a vague recollection of this incident added to this, quote, nothing came out of the report. Also, there was no formalized procedures for record maintenance, which was corrected in 2018 moving forward.
record, so the lack of records is expected for 2017. I also reached out to two other volunteers that I know Des worked with at Akon, and unfortunately neither of them got back to me. But I also reached out to Shane Holmberg, who was Akon's director of operations at the time, who said about it, I don't recall something like that being reported that high, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was covered up. Akon had a do not hire list and a blacklist. In order to get on it for anything aside from no call no shows, there had to be a good reason and some involvement from upper management. My guess is Des may never have been put on the list, or it never made it that high. Due to the lack of documentation, we'll probably never have the complete truth of what happened here. You're free to draw your own conclusions, of course, but the impression that I got from learning all this, at the very least, was that this incident was reported, but for some reason the report never made it high up the ladder, letting it go easily undocumented at a con that, at least at the time, already lacked in record keeping. This lack of record keeping is also probably why there's so much fuzziness around the question of whether or not Des was fully blacklisted. Based on what Shane and the aforementioned volunteer told me, it seems somewhat unlikely to me that Des was ever, like, fully and officially blacklisted, but I wouldn't be shocked to hear if there were miscommunications at some phase that caused some people to think that she was. But that's just the impression that I got. The provable facts of this situation are few, and basically boil down to that there's at least three people who claim to remember this happening or being reported, there's no surviving formal documentation of it, though a lack of documentation is typical for Acon 2017. And as for SoonerCon, it's unlikely, but nonetheless, not entirely clear whether or not she had ever volunteered there before then, but at the very least, I can certainly say with confidence that she has not volunteered there since. In the interest of learning more about con operations and securing a contract for AzumiCon with SoonerCon's then venue, the Reed Center in Midwest City, she, quote, sorta ish volunteered over in the green room, like once for a few hours on the hotel side of SoonerCon's con ops. And then as far as AzumiCon goes, we know that 2014 was her second AzumiCon overall, and the first IzumiCon that she ever volunteered at. She was on the events team, but didn't complete the critical paperwork as needed, so when she applied to volunteer again the next year, she was sent to ops, which in this context means that she'd be a door watcher, so, you know, very little paperwork required. It's unclear what she spent her first few volunteer hours doing, but the reason that she'd become noteworthy, for better or for worse, was because of what she did when she was given what's largely seen as one of the most simple tasks that the con had available, to watch the exit of the dealer's room. Now, like I said, this is a pretty easy job that mostly just involves sitting there. You know, you can be on your phone, you can chat with the people nearby, you can do pretty much whatever you want as long as you're physically present. Like, I cannot stress enough just how low maintenance this task is. In theory, this should not be a problem. Name a yellow fruit. Orange. This is what Cisco, the then director of ConOps, as well as a few other then AzumiCon directors allege happened. At one point during Dez's shift, Cisco is told that some people have snuck into the dealer's room via the exit because nobody's posted there. And he says, No, Dez is supposed to be there. Yeah, well, Dez is gone. It wasn't until at least a few minutes after Cisco confirmed that Dez was indeed gone, and who knows how long she'd been gone by that point. Anyways, that's when she finally sent him a text saying that she reached her minimum hour requirement to get her free badge, so she was gonna go enjoy the con. Nobody that I spoke to about this knows for a fact why she did this, but there is some hearsay that she would later tell people that it was because she felt that she had been there for too long and that no one came to relieve her. But regardless of why... It still created a massive problem for Cisco and the other volunteers. And to make matters even worse, when Cisco checked the volunteer log, he saw that despite what Des had told him, she was still a few hours short of that minimum requirement. She was then given the option of finishing her shift and actually hitting the requirement or quitting early, and she chose to quit early. Yeah, needless to say, Cisco was furious and he requested that she be blacklisted from volunteering again right then and there. And his request 
Next was sort of accepted. In more official language, she was put on probation. This resulted in her getting rejected from volunteering in guest relations in 2017. And this rejection is interesting, because we can see Des saying that she only applied because she spoke to the then guests relations director at a dinner meeting where she told Des that she could always use backups. But the then guest relations director would say to the other IzumiCon directors that not only did she never tell this to Des, but that she also wanted Des nowhere near her team, so, you know, eyes emoji. Nobody in IzumiCon's directorial circle heard anything new about Des until several months later when, out of the blue, they saw a Facebook post saying that she was the new owner of the convention. Yeah, you heard me correctly. The same person who was very nearly blacklisted from volunteering at IzumiCon was now its new owner, and if that caught you off guard just now, yeah, just try to imagine how IzumiCon's directors felt about it when they heard the news. In fact, Cisco told told me how every single phone call he made to the rest of the ops team to tell them about this went exactly the same. Hi, it's Cisco. Okay, remember Dez? Yeah, she's the new owner of the con. What the fuck? It was a pretty well-known fact that Dez was unemployed and rather broke at the time, so yeah, confusion and surprise were definitely the initial reactions that all the directors had. In fact, the confusion is still kinda there, because none of the directors that I spoke to seemed to know for an absolute fact just how or under what conditions she was sold the con. I've been told that the story she would usually tell people when they asked about it was that she planned on paying Marlin and Faisal back over time, presumably with profits from the con. But the key word here is usually. I've heard other claims like that she said she paid 10 grand for the con, or that she said she was gonna give Marlin and Faisal a certain percentage of the con's profits each year. You know, stuff that sounds kinda similar and like they may be able to coexist, but also they're just different enough that you can't help but feel at least a little skeptical, especially if you know the fate that would befall this con and are therefore blessed with the power of hindsight. And you know, the worst part of all this is that these weren't even the wildest Des is not good at describing how she obtained or planned on obtaining money stories that I heard throughout the research process of this video. Yeah, they're not even close. No, that dubious honor definitely goes to the weird ways in which Des described how she was going to get money to maintain the con. We'll talk more about this later, but Des didn't seem to have a very strong grasp on what a sponsor was and how she was going to get them. That being said, many of the people that I spoke to recall her speaking in one way or another about having some kind of anonymous benefactor who was going to take care of the con's finances. In fact, two directors alleged that she had privately told the two of them in person that, get this, the con was actually being bankrolled by a certain voice actor who wanted to save it, but this had to stay on the down low because, well, if this information got out, it could jeopardize her contract. Wait, what? Yeah, many people seem to recall hearing Des say that the aforementioned benefactor was a voice actor who she only sometimes name dropped, and I guess the idea was that this voice actor was gonna bankroll the con through Des because... Reasons? A screenshot of a conversation Des had with a then friend of hers shows her alleging that the voice actor is giving her the money needed to start her LLC and talks about him in a way that makes it sound like he's not unlike a business partner of sorts. There's another screenshot the then friend gave me where Des can be seen alleging that the voice actor's involvement was limited to giving her $100 for her to start her LLC and that he was never officially a partner. For what it's worth though, I have contacted the voice actor in question, they understandably do not want to be named, and they've denied having any interest or intent on bankrolling IzumiCon in any capacity. I didn't find out about Des alleging that the voice actor paid for her to start her LLC until considerably after I spoke to the voice actor, and when I tried contacting them again to clarify whether or not they did that, I didn't get a response. 
in any case, I've gotten really off topic, so to go ahead and just swerve back to the peculiar issue of precisely how Dez came into owning the con, I asked Faisal about it, and he told me, quote, Dez contacted Marlin and said she was interested and didn't want the con to die. We sold slash gave it to her to hope that the con would continue. We were paid $100 for it, so this wasn't a profit-motivated sale. And I want to make a little footnote here, you know, just for the sake of clarity. By all accounts, this, indeed, was never intended to be a profit-motivated sale. To pay $100 for the name and IP of a convention the size of IzumiCon is 100% not normal. As a matter of fact, really, you wouldn't be totally off the mark if you said this exchange was more like a conditional giveaway than a sales transaction. I can't go into specifics because I haven't actually seen the contracts, and actually I'm told by Faisal that I can't see the contract because of clauses within them, but anyways, it's my own understanding that contractual problems, rather than finances, were at the heart of why other potential buyers, or the ones that I spoke to at the very least, didn't actually go through with it. Obviously, I have no way of knowing for sure whether or not Dez's contract was identical to theirs, but at the very least, it seems like Dez's wasn't exactly something that most buyers would consider perfect either, as it had a clause in it that could result in ownership being reverted back to Dyad. According to Faisal, the contract with Dez says that if if she decided to end the convention and not use the name, there is a clause saying Dyad could reclaim the name. But ownership is a vague term. Her company still owns the IP. I'd still need to reclaim the name and IP through a contract or agreement. I would not gain control of her company, but simply the ability to use the name Zumicon. I've heard just about every theory there is about why this con was given to Dez, despite her being such an extremely not great candidate, but... The most common two among the people who I spoke to about it who were involved with the con tend to be either A, that finding a new owner was taking way more time and effort than Marlon and Faisal expected, and they just got to a point where they wanted to be done with the whole thing, and Des was just the first person who threw her hat in the ring, who either didn't know or didn't care about the details of the contract, and B, that it was a decision fueled by spite toward the older Izumi con directors, some of whom attended attempted to buy the con, but ultimately didn't because of the contract. To re-emphasize though, both of these are just speculation. For the time being though, I'm more curious about why Des was interested in owning the con. You know, did she genuinely feel like she could save it? Did she wrongfully assume that being the owner of a medium-sized con is a super profitable job? Did she just not want someone else to have it? You know, maybe she thought it'd be a lot simpler of a job than it actually was, or Hey, you know, maybe it was something else altogether. I don't know, and in the absence of any word from Dez, perhaps I never will. In fact, I'll also probably never know why she didn't make sure her team was on the same page about how she really came into owning the con. Obviously, I can't say with total certainty whether or not anybody outside of she, Marlin, and Faisal knew the truth, but if nothing else, I can say with a lot of confidence that a lot of different people allege hearing a lot of different stories. At best, you could interpret this as Dez's horrible communication skills at work, and that she was just being wildly misunderstood very frequently. But at worst, it's really easy to look at this and see someone who's intentionally lying, presumably so they can make it look like their shaky position of leadership is even somewhat credible in the eyes of their team. But, you know, regardless of how you want to interpret this, it's still really hard to hear about this and not feel like it's an ill omen of what's to come or something like that. But anyways, before I start rambling too much about this, let's go ahead and get back to that initial announcement Des made about her ownership. Once the surprise had time to die down, the next feeling everyone shared was concern, and honestly, can you blame them? I mean, it's not exactly a huge stretch to be worried when you're told that you now have to take instructions from someone who has a track record of not following instructions. In other words, it was incredibly important for Des to redeem her image in the eyes of her new 
your team. You know, your first action upon entering a position of leadership is perhaps your most important because that's what's going to reveal what your priorities are and it's going to give your team a good idea of what to expect from you. So with all that being said, how was Dez going to set the tone for her leadership? How was she going to prove to everyone that the almost blacklisted slacker of 2015 was all in the past? Well, it's simple she was gonna have a meal with them. Now, the idea of assembling your team to have a meal together somewhere so you can all talk business, I mean, yeah, that should be totally fine. The business lunch is a strategy as old as time. You know, in theory, this shouldn't be a problem. I have banana peel on the ground. I'm gonna see if it's really slippery like it is in the cartoon. <laughs> Well, this business lunch, or dinner rather, did indeed set the tone for what Dez's leadership was going to be like, because by all accounts, it was incredibly chaotic. First of all, there was the suddenness of the whole thing. Yeah, nobody that I spoke to about this could recall getting more than a week's notice about it, which was kind of a problem, because a fair number of the directors didn't live in or close to OKC. But Izumi Khan's team was nothing if not dedicated, so despite all that, they still managed to be in OKC that weekend. Where in OKC though, you may be wondering? Uh, well, yeah, actually, they were wondering that too. It wasn't until pretty much the last possible second, according to the aforementioned people that I spoke to about this, that they had any idea where specifically they were supposed to be meeting, but that they ultimately settled on a Denny's, that they were dangerously close to filling to capacity since many of the directors had to bring along their family members, and then Des had brought along her husband and two of her friends as her team. Yeah, crammed was the second most common word used to describe what this meeting was like, and the first, in case you were wondering, was disorganized. Yeah, many of the directors could have, and would have, I'm sure, forgiven just how much difficulty Dez had in getting them all in the same spot if Dez had offered them even a single crumb of inspiring leadership. But the directors recall her being really inconsistent throughout this meeting, saying stuff like that she didn't want to change anything, immediately before going on tangents about all the things she wanted to change. Their questions were given non-answers, Des didn't seem to have a particularly good understanding of how the con worked, and this is all to say nothing of the experience that she very clearly lacked. She was, most of it boiled down to, I really love this cod and I wanted to succeed. No business plan, no talk of investors, no, no concept of management. I mean, the, the, the amount of information lacking was terrifying. By the end of the meeting, the more optimistic directors were thinking, okay, so, you know, Des clearly lacks experience and know-how, but, you know, maybe that'll encourage her to just leave the heavy lifting to us, you know? We can keep doing our jobs the way we always have, and Des will just kind of be sort of a puppet or a placeholder leader. Yeah, yeah, maybe we can get this to work out after all. <laughs> Everyone else, on the other hand, could only think that Des was completely and utterly incompetent. Shortly after this meeting, Cisco became the first of Izumi Khan's directors to resign under Des's leadership, and he actually did so via a video. After about an hour of counsel with a number of close friends as well as the Fellow leadership of ZumiCon operations, I have decided that I will no longer serve as director for ZumiCon, nor will I be volunteering in any capacity. I wanted you to know that the crux of my decision is very simple and frankly rests at your feet. I will not follow the leadership of someone who of their own accord decided they were not fit to follow my instructions. The basic tenet of security is never abandon your post. You broke that tenet and you were likewise judged unfit for duty with security. I will not ask my people to follow instructions from me when I have to follow instructions from someone who is not fit to follow my directions. Shortly after recording this, Cisco would record another video explaining his decision to his fellow volunteers who weren't at the Denny's meeting. He then put the video up on Facebook where it was set to friends only. While the general public would certainly never see this video, a significant number of IzumiCon volunteers still did. And even though this video didn't necessarily spread like wildfire, I still don't think it's a stretch to say that this video was still a signal, the first signal, as a matter of fact, that someone 
one, more or less from the outside looking in, could have got that things over at IzumiCon weren't exactly off to a great start, and things were only going to go downhill from here. Within the following days, weeks, and months of this meeting, many followed Cisco's example and sent in their resignations as well, but a core team of directors still decided to stay on board. Many of them were asked to take on responsibilities that were normally outside of their roles because of all the resignations. Presumably, this is also why Des would, at least somewhat frequently, try to offer directorial positions to some of her friends and other people involved in various facets of the con. In any case, throughout the planning process of IzumiCon 2018, the turnover rate for convention leadership was not insignificant. The cosplay department, for example, proved to be a particularly difficult position to fill, and it was eventually reabsorbed into events, and therefore went through three different leaders. But anyways, the bottom line here is that throughout the planning of IzumiCon 2018, there were a lot of resignations coming from a lot of different people, but there were a few experienced IzumiCon directors who toughed it out and decided to stay with the con despite all the extra work. They didn't know it at the time, but they were effectively following IzumiCon into its grave. Hey, from IzumiCon 2018, I'm here, here to talk to you about everything IzumiCon. Guys, this is a big year, and we got a lot of firsts. First thing I want to talk about, we got a whole new owner. Her name is Des. She's worked with IzumiCon in the past, she's worked with other conventions. She stepped on an owner at IzumiCon this year, and she's going to try to make it a great convention. Not just a great convention, she's going to make this a welcoming convention for all the fandoms in Oklahoma to come together and have a big party together. So let's talk to Des real fast. Hey everyone, I am Des. I am the new owner of IzumiCon, and I am really looking forward to having an awesome IzumiCon 2018 with all of you all. Uh, for this IzumiCon, we're going to be having Blue Bunny cosplay. We are going to have Justin Nimmo. He's the Silver Power Ranger for Power Rangers in Space. And we will be having J. Michael Tatum. So we look forward to seeing you there. Thanks, Des. That sounds awesome. Planning IzumiCon under Dez's so-called leadership was, by all accounts, an absolute nightmare for everyone. For example, potential con-goers can tell you horror stories like about how disingenuous Dez was about blacklisting people from the con. The irony that she herself was very nearly blacklisted only a few years prior was evidently lost on her. Anyways, there were two documented instances where people were blacklisted, at least temporarily, and they were both for flimsy and or unapparent reasons. One was a former volunteer who was also one of the con's potential buyers. The cause given for blacklisting them was because they, quote, tried to manipulate their way into owning the con and started personal drama. Neither party would confirm nor elaborate on the incident at the time, and when I tried reaching out to the volunteer, I didn't get a response. Anyways, the other instance was with a con goer called AJ. Now, a quick disclaimer, as far as I can tell, Des was the only person within a Zoom Khan, who was at the center of this whole thing from the start, that she's the one who made this decision seemingly without any input from anyone else within IzumiCon until after she did it. And it's because of that, and because a lot of IzumiCon related posts from around this time have been wiped from the internet, but more on that later, I didn't really have a lot of hard evidence to go off of for this incident. For example, there's only one surviving email I was shown about this, and while it's not explicit about banning AJ from the event itself, it is explicit about blocking her from the IzumiCon social media, and that no one outside of Dez had much specific info to go off of while this was happening. Nonetheless, AJ is under the impression that she was at least temporarily blacklisted from the event, and another director who I spoke to, who was eventually roped into all this, also believes that AJ was meant to have been blacklisted from the event. So with that out of the way, what happened? Well, in AJ's words, at the end, I was allowed back and not blacklisted, as it had no grounds. Des believed that I made a nasty criticism about the con and posted in the IzumiCon Facebook group, then wouldn't tell me what the comment was, and just blocked me and blacklisted me. But if the staff felt that I was just being negative, no one said so. All of this action was being done with no communication toward me. 
Now, for context, AJ wasn't exactly just some completely random con-goer. No. AJ was actually a former con volunteer. I've been asked not to go into specifics, and those details are frankly irrelevant to the story anyways. So, suffice to say, AJ loved the con, but she was, in the eyes of a lot of Izumi Khan's leadership, a handful. So then, was Dez just looking for an excuse, no matter how flimsy, to not have to deal with AJ? Was she trying to inspire fear among people who might have otherwise criticized the con? Was this whole thing just a misunderstanding? Or maybe this was just a knee-jerk reaction that went too far? It's hard to tell for sure, but judging by the fact that the decision was soon reversed, I'm hoping slash guessing that means that somehow Dez at least eventually agreed that she was being unfair to AJ. Nonetheless, this whole thing became a bit of a spectacle and didn't exactly leave a good impression of Dez to those in Izumi Khan's community who watched it unfold. And then there's the directors and volunteers who stuck around whose Dez-related horror stories are a thousand times worse. For example, my personal favorite comes from the Khan's Rapid Response team leader, who alleges that at some stage, Dez told the venue that Izumi Khan's security was fully armed. As a matter of fact, let me go ahead and say that one more time just for emphasis. It's been alleged that Dez told the venue that Izumi Khan had fully armed security. Yeah, if this allegation is true, then beyond being a huge mistake at best or blatant lie at worst, Dez telling this to the venue also could have turned into a massive liability if the rapid response team leader hadn't corrected it. And there's another story that I think all of you are going to be particularly interested in, and that's about how Dez got a videographer to help with the con's marketing. And part of that marketing involved recording interviews with some of Izumi Khan's would-be guests. But because the con, well, imploded, most of these interviews just never got published. And the only one that did get published, the one with Jade Saxton, was promptly taken down and now only exists as an unlisted YouTube video. Thank you so much for coming and talking to us. That's going to oh, wrap yeah. us up for Izumi Khan's behind the scenes conversation um yeah it's gonna be there guys. guys come see your in convention August. i'm really excited to come and hang out with you guys so yeah have a nice day <laughs> bye but as wild as all that is, I think nothing encapsulates the chaos of Dez's leadership quite as well as the messy story of IzumiKon's promotional art contest. So here's what happened. When Dez got IzumiKon, the con lost the rights to its mascot character, Izumi. And I guess Dez wasn't privy to the fact that, hey, art costs money to make. And especially when it's art that's going to be plastered all over your con's marketing materials. Yeah, odds are it's going to cost you a good chunk of change. An anonymous would-be attendee alleges having seen Dez posting in the Artist Alley International Facebook group asking about what would be a fair price for such art, and being shocked that she was told to expect no less than a few hundreds of dollars. This lines up pretty well with what Carnival Grotesque, another artist who we'll talk more about in just a moment, told me that, quote, Dez asked me what sort of prices that she should be expecting from artists she commissioned. Apparently, everyone she spoke to had exorbitant prices. I explained that it was best practice to add additional fees to commission prices if your art's going to be used for promotional material because artists lose revenue while the company using it gains revenue by using their art. She grumbled about it and asked what my prices would be. Spoilers, they would normally be super high. So now, faced with the reality that, well, art costs money, the Artist Alley director alleges that Dez decided that she wanted IzumiKon to do what every other corporate machine who wants art but doesn't want to pay for it does. To throw a contest and let the winner get paid with the privilege of having their art featured by the con as well as two special event tickets. Yeah, not con badges, but special event tickets. So, you know, basically they'd be getting free add-ons to their badges but not their actual badges. Yeah, Dez still wanted them to pay for those. Foreshadowing alert, Dez not wanting to give away free badges, even to people who should normally get them, is gonna be a recurring element in this story. But yeah, to get back to the contest prize, in case it wasn't already obvious, this is all just a dressed up way of saying that the winning artists were gonna get paid with exposure, which itself is a dressed up way of saying that they wouldn't get paid. Despite her concerns about the whole thing, Ashley, 
Alley, Izumi-kun's Artist Alley director, was given the task of operating the contest, but unfortunately that didn't really stop Dez from trying to involve herself throughout the process anyways. Yeah, this is where things start to get messy. So originally, the contest was supposed to end on Halloween 2017, and it did, and the winner was an artist called Via That One Artist. Except she was supposed to be one of two winners, and a second winner hadn't been picked, presumably because there were so few entries. Yeah, can't imagine why people weren't lining up to enter. Huh, weird, who'd have thunk it? Anyways, shortly after Via is contacted congratulating her on her win, Izumi-Kan announces that it's just extending the art contest, which at this point everyone thought it had already ended, so a lot of people just saw this as a second contest altogether. Although I don't think this was made public information at the time, you know, it's possible that it got posted on Facebook at some point and left unarchived, but even if that's the case, then that would mean that this was only mentioned on Facebook, but anyways, the only difference was that now the prize was being slightly upgraded. The winner would now get a free table in the artist Sally and two weekend badges. And luckily, yeah, Via's prize was getting upgraded as well. Foreshadowing alert, Des eventually relenting on giving free badges to the people who'd normally get them is also a recurring element in this story. But anyways, while this upgrade was definitely a step in the right direction, make no mistake, this is still a far cry from fair payment for doing so much of the con's official art. Nonetheless, the contest continued. Fast forward to late November. Des sends a message to Carnival Grotesque about a post she was going to make in the Artist Alley International group. The post was about Izumi Khan's art contest, basically saying, yeah, we need a lot of art, we're running a contest, but I don't think that's going to be enough. She goes on to say that she's consulted with other artists, that she can't afford them, and that she was wondering if anyone in the group would offer some kind of affordable commission package deal. As a side note, by the way, I asked Via if she had any idea that Des was doing this, and she said, I didn't know this. I felt like after winning that contest that my art would have been finally used in a professional sort of way, which was a dream at the time. But finding this out is kind of a slap in the face. But if she was worrying about my workload rather than the quality of my art, I can definitely see her point. But rest assured, I was, and still kind of am, an artist with a pretty quick turnaround, so the load wasn't much of a concern at the time for me. In any case, the Post received one reply that would particularly stand out, one from a local artist called Purwitch who'd been wanting to visit IzumiCon and offered to help in exchange for an artist alley table and two badges. Ultimately, IzumiCon would end up taking her up on this offer a few months later. More specifically, she'd be asked to handle the t-shirt designs. But in the meantime, another artist won the second contest, which ended on December 3rd, and for a while, it really seemed like Izumi Khan finally had a plan ready for who was going to do what regarding art. Or, you know, at least that would have been the case if Des hadn't gotten into contact with another artist and childhood friend of hers, Carnival Grotesque. More specifically, the problem was that she did did this without any input from Ashley, so when Des told Carnival to contact Ashley for more details, Ashley didn't know what to tell them because Des had left Ashley completely out of the loop on this decision. Ashley recalled to me that it was honestly a huge mess because Des would communicate one thing to me and then turn around and, like she had completely forgotten that we had it planned out already, would go off on her own thing and I'd have to respond to people she had contacted and basically tell them that we already had it covered. There was an idea at some stage to let Carnival do the site art, but the person who found Create a ZumiCon website added to their already overwhelmed list of responsibilities opted for a bare bones design. And so with all the other tasks accounted for, there was just nothing left for Carnival to do. And so despite the promises that Des had made, Carnival was told that their art wouldn't be needed and that they'd have to pay for their artist alley table at a ZumiCon after all if they still wanted one. Carnival's contact with Ashley had been pretty limited up until this point, so understandably this left them feeling pretty frustrated. As for Via, Perwich, and the second winner, well, although their art was still going to be used, or at least that was the plan, unfortunately all their work would end up going to waste, but I don't want to get too ahead of myself. Bottom line, this whole situation was a mess. And remember, this is only one of many similar stories that pretty much anyone who's 
state at IzumiCon can tell you if you ask them about what kind of a leader Dez was. Whether or not Dez herself was under any illusions about the quality of her guidance is unclear, but she did at least seem to be aware that even early on there was a lot of distrust toward her from IzumiCon's old guard. And, you know, in fairness, she was right about that much. After that meeting at Denny's, the bar for her leadership was remarkably low. But even so, nothing could have prepared anyone for what she was about to do next. So, by the time August 2018, aka the month of the con, rolled around, Dez knew that the con still owed a lot of money. To be more specific, Dez didn't give the precise details to everybody. In fact, her go-to line when asked about finances seemed to just be, money is tight. But based on surviving screenshots of budgetary info and a message that Dez sent on July 30th, the con needed somewhere between 30 and 40 grand to happen. The con, however, had only collected a little over 20 grand from Square and Eventbrite, the third-party ticket vendors from which prospective vendors and attendees respectively could buy their tables and badges. A semi-secret emergency meeting was called on August 4th, but, you know, by that point, there really wasn't a lot that anybody could do. The con was still several thousands of dollars short, and Dez had failed to secure any paid sponsorships for the con, and that included both Loot and XP and Unlocked, both of whom it's been alleged that Dez attempted to get sponsorships from. It also possibly included Midwest City's Convention and Visitors Bureau, who Dez alleged in the email about her aforementioned horror con that never really went anywhere, was giving at least $500 to a ZoomiCon. That being said, Despite what she says in the email, I couldn't find any mentions of them on archives of IzumiCon 2018's site. I emailed the person she claimed to be her contact within the Bureau, but I never got a response. But going back to Luton XP and Unlocked, since there's just way more to talk about there, Luton XP's is the less complicated of the two stories, so we'll go ahead and start with it. So, basically, they were a local game store who helped run and supply IzumiCon's tabletop room for a couple of years. In exchange, they were basically treated as volunteers. You know, they got free badges, they could hang out in the staff areas, all that good stuff. Allegedly, the first time that Loot's owner, DC, heard about the con going under new ownership is when one of the old directors told him that Dez was bad news. Yeah, definitely not a good first impression, but... Unfortunately, one that would be telling of the rocky experience Loot would have with her. DC wouldn't receive any kind of official word from IzumiCon until November of 2017, when he got a message from one of the newer directors asking if he'd heard anything yet. Which, well, he hadn't heard anything particularly concrete. Yeah, turns out there was a lot of confusion surrounding someone getting back to him, but... It was settled now, at least. Never a fan of documentation, much to my dismay, Dez later invited DC to an in-person meeting in February. DC gave me the disclaimer that at the time of our talking about this, he was receiving treatment for a memory disorder, though he doesn't recall much getting done at this meeting because... Allegedly, Dez was preoccupied with watching a child pretty much the entire time. Dez would therefore conduct much of her business with Luton XP via a phone call with DC and his business partner. DC further alleges that Dez wanted Loot to sponsor IzumiCon and tried to get him to pay for both his badge and the badges of anyone else within Loot who was going to be at the con. He said no, of course, and told her that this hasn't been the way his relationship with IzumiCon ever worked. Dez eventually relented and said that Loot could be a sponsor for the con without actually having to pay for it. She'd also later say in a Facebook message that DC's business partner couldn't be present in any of the future phone calls. Yeah, a peculiar choice which DC attributes to the fact that his business partner takes zero BS, which is probably why, in his opinion, Dez didn't like him very much. As a side note, by the way, I'm very curious about what Dez's intended benefits for sponsors were because I haven't seen Loot's logo anywhere on IzumiCon's website, and while the con's Facebook page and group are long gone now, I still can't find any tweets about them either, and that's Sponsorship 101 right there. In any case, at its core, DC's claim more or less boils down to highly questionable leadership on Dez's part that could have been resolved easily if she had even a pinch of experience or know-how, which is very much the experience that I had with Dez at the time too, actually. So personally... I find DC's story incredibly believable. So, 
I sent an email to Ladder, you know, to Dez in February 2018 because I heard that the con was under new ownership and I couldn't help but notice that despite the con being six months away, there was still no info on the site about panel apps. I was also wondering about how Dez intended to reimburse panelists. Namely, I was wondering if she was either going to keep doing what AzumiCon had been doing, or at least the year prior, and only giving free badges to panelists who did six hours or more worth of panels, if she was going to do what a lot of larger cons do and give free badges to every panel organizer and then maybe a set number of co-panelists, or if she just had a different plan altogether. She replies to me a few days later with a link to a Google Doc, which didn't answer my reimbursement question, so I ask again. She says, we will be resuming this policy. I do not know what policy she is referring to, and I ask her to be more clear. Finally, and with information contradicting what was in the doc, but I'm thinking that, you know, she's the owner and I can screenshot this, so it's whatever. Anyways, she tells me that any panelist doing even one panel will get a free badge. Awesome. Fast forward to June. I'd recently got back from being out of town for a while. I got a new job. I was really busy and... In the midst of all this, I just kind of goofed up and missed the deadline for panel applications. I sent an email asking if I could put in a late application. After all, the deadline had only passed about a week ago at this point, so I figured it'd be worth a shot. A month passes before I hear anything back, at which point a brand new event director tells me that the deadline for panel apps is being extended. I didn't know this at the time, but evidently it was almost certainly because AzumiCon received remarkably fewer panel apps that year than it had in previous years. Yeah, can't imagine why. Anyways, I'm told that I can do my panel apps via email, and I do, and then I ask how they want to handle getting my badge information. The event director tells me that the con's new owner, you know, that Dez was making it a new policy this year that panelists would basically just be a different flavor of volunteer, meaning that they would need to put in at least 18 hours of work before they could qualify for a free badge, and that my panels would only count towards six of those hours. This could not be any more opposite of what Des had told me several months earlier if it tried. Now, obviously by this point, I'd heard through the grapevine that Des wasn't exactly a well full of experience from which the con was now drawing generously from, but still, this was the moment where that all became real to me. It was where her lack of experience simply could not have been any less subtle to me, even if it painted itself purple and danced naked on top of a harpsichord, <laughs> singing... Des is inexperienced. Luckily for me, though, I had a screenshot of the owner of the con, you know, of Des, telling me that anyone doing a panel gets a free badge, and I showed this to the event director, who, in hindsight, I feel really bad for because this simply could not have been any fun to deal with, new to the position or not. Anyways, the event director gets back to me saying that Des says that I can have a Saturday-only badge for free. Something that I remember thinking was really weird because the con wasn't selling single-day badges badges on Eventbrite. But, you know, regardless, I say awesome. In that case, please go ahead and schedule any panels I have that make it into the con for that Saturday. But then, a few days later, the con made a now-lost announcement via Facebook that panelists who applied before a certain date would get free weekend-long badges. I ask if that includes me and say that my panels can be scheduled for whatever day if it does, and lo and behold, it did include me, and that was sort of that. The last thing I'd hear from the con was an email on August 6th saying that the schedule would be up soon, but as you can probably imagine, nothing ever seemed to come of that. And just like with DC, this whole situation felt... I don't know, I don't want to blow this out of proportion and say that it was totally unacceptable behavior, because it wasn't, you know, stuff happened. But being there, you could definitely tell that there was a weird vibe within IzumiCon, that there were probably some internal issues surrounding communication and Dez's increasingly obvious lack of know-how, you know? <laughs> In any case, the bottom line here, the point of me telling you all that is that the idea of DC basically having to tell Dez how Loot's relationship with IzumiCon worked in previous years, a relationship that probably would have been pretty easy to predict even with a little bit of experience, you know, most cons do have tabletop rooms after all, and then Dez 
eventually relenting to giving away free badges after trying to squeeze any last penny she could get from someone who otherwise wouldn't and shouldn't be paying for a badge. Yeah, I noticed a lot of similarities in our stories, so even though he doesn't have many screenshots, I still find his story pretty believable. Furthermore, it reminds me of yet another similar story, this time by Jaden, a would-be member of the press at IzumiCon who had emails to back up his story. Essentially, Dez had pre-approved a press badge for him almost a year in advance to vlog at the event, but lo and behold, that didn't seem to work out either, as only a few weeks before the con, he was told by IzumiCon's press director that the press team was full, so while he couldn't get a badge, he could still attend as a regular attendee, even though, you know, Des had promised him a pre-approved press badge. I don't know if this was rooted in a problem on Des's end, the press director's end, a mix of both, or maybe even something else altogether, but it's nonetheless consistent with this, well, what appears to be a sort of pattern of misunderstandings and miscommunications surrounding badges. But before I veer too off topic again, yeah, so that's the story about Loot's experience with IzumiCon, and mine and Jaden's for that that matter, but it's my video, so I'll do what I want. But anyways, despite all that, things were still much more complicated when it came to the other alleged possible sponsor, Unlocked. Yeah, brace yourself for this one. So Unlocked was a short-lived platform for voice actors to stream and interact with their fans, and it was still pretty new at this point. It launched back in 2017. When asked about it, Dez's contact within Unlocked couldn't remember how precisely talks about getting Unlocked to stream at IzumiCon began, but but at some stage between late 2017 or early 2018, well, this happened. The idea was that Unlocked would stream some panels, some exclusive content would get made, everyone would have a great time, and the whole thing would just be a wonderful success. As a matter of fact, check this out, that's why those aforementioned interviews that never saw the light of day were made. They were supposed to get posted on Unlocked. Um, we are doing these interview series on Unlocked, it's the new home of our behind the scenes footage, and I know you a lot of the finer details of this deal have become lost because, like the steaming majority of the rest of the cons planning, Des seemed to prefer conducting business over the phone via Skype calls and in-person meetings, so, you know, ways that wouldn't leave any physical proof. And that, in addition to the small number of people that Des involved in making this deal uh, happen, made this peculiar part of IzumiCon's story especially difficult to navigate. Nonetheless, I'll do my best to tell you what I can. So, it's unclear how many people she said this to, but there is physical evidence of Dez talking about getting a sponsorship from Unlocked at least once. And yet, when I spoke to her contact within Unlocked, their exact words when I asked if there was ever any intention for Unlocked to give money to IzumiCon were, and I quote, Hell no. Based on a message that she sent to the videographer on August 6th, Dez's claim seemed to be that Unlocked had been planning on sponsoring IzumiCon, but that at some point she criticized the app's then current viability and that her contact took this to heart and shared it to others within Unlocked and that it, uh, had such a profound effect that it prompted them to rework the app from scratch and only weeks before the con, no less. And that, in addition to the app's then iOS exclusivity, is why IzumiCon received no financial support from Unlocked. Her contacts said that they would speak to investors about finding some other way of supporting the con, but nothing ever seemed to come of that. Meanwhile, Dez's contact within Unlocked's claim is that they never had any intention of sponsoring the con or giving it money in any capacity, and they were really confused about how Des might have reached the conclusion that they were. So, fact. There's a lot of variation when it comes to cons organizing sponsorship contracts, and a lot of it varies based on the size of the con and the level of the sponsorship. That being said, I spoke to a few people who've worked on the con side and the brand side of organizing con sponsorships, and here's a couple of general takeaways that I got. For starters, larger sponsorships are almost exclusively made at least several months in advance, and in some especially high-level cases, it can even be over a year in advance 
advance via multi-year contracts. And on the flip side of that, lower level sponsorships, while it's generally advised for their own sake that they can organize a sponsorship at least a few months in advance, some cons can be pretty flexible about making sponsorships happen relatively last minute if they need to. And the smaller the con, the more flexible they're likely to be. When contracts are drawn up, the payment is usually either upfront or made within 30 to 90 days of the contract being signed. We know based on the would-be unlocked interviews and a screenshot of an ultimately unused messenger group chat that Des made for everyone involved in this deal, that Unlocked and Izumi Khan were, you know, in at least some sort of contact with each other well over six months in advance of the con. If Unlocked really was meant to be a sponsor, then there was plenty of time for contracts to be drawn up and for money to be paid. Opinion. Dez's story just in general, is extremely naive to the point of being outlandish, but it's especially so in the way it paints how sponsorship relationships work. Namely, in that her story, Unlocked is just kinda able to say, hey, JK, we're not gonna support the con after all, literally weeks before the event, despite several months of contact, and then they can just decide that they're no longer gonna give the con money, even though under normal circumstances, they would have signed a contract and paid by now. Furthermore, there's seemingly no repercussions for them doing this, and not even a promise that they'll sponsor the con the next year instead, or something like that. Dez's story gives off the vibes of someone who doesn't know anything about sponsorship organization making some kind of fanciful guess at how it works, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's exactly that. It's a fanciful guess, and in this case, it certainly doesn't seem like an accurate one. Allegation. The videographer I mentioned earlier was present on either one or two calls with Des and Unlocked and recalled to me that she said there was money and that they would be a sponsor. But in the one or two calls I had with her Unlocked contact, it was never discussed. They just said that they wanted to stream there and that they also wanted to put all our promo videos on there. I don't recall her contact mentioning the sponsorship. Fact. Even from the start, an Android version seemed to at least be something on Unlock's radar. Although Unlock's Android version wouldn't launch until December of 2018, signups to participate in an eventual beta could be made as early as Unlock's launch month, September of 2017. Said Unlocked co-founder Bryce Pappenbrook in an interview with ANN in February 2018, we're bringing some really awesome content to the app and we're in mid-development on an Android release. I'd say that one of the biggest requests we're getting is to come out with this app for Android, and it's just all a work in progress. Opinion. The idea that Dez's criticism of Unlocked was so meaningful that it prompted the app to rework itself from scratch seems extremely unlikely, to put it nicely. Furthermore, everyone at Unlocked knew that it was an iOS exclusive from the start. You know, somehow the idea that they had only just then become aware of it suddenly and then wanted to back out of supporting the con because of this seems also extremely unlikely, to put it nicely. Also, literally Literally, where did this 70% of potential users number come from? Like, literally where? Is this supposed to be potential users in general? Or potential users within IzumiCon? Either way, Dez, cite your source. Allegation. According to Dez's unlocked contact, the app's then iOS exclusivity had nothing to do with why they would or wouldn't have been at the con. It had nothing to do with exclusivity and everything to do with talks that just never progressed at the speed unlocked needed them to, and then eventually the news that the con, well, imploded, but let's not get too ahead of ourselves. When asked about whether or not unlocked would have been at the con in the event that it, you know, happened, her contact said, maybe. In any case, regardless of how you want to interpret what I've nicknamed the Unlocked Arc, the bottom line here is nonetheless that money was tight and that despite what Dez was hoping, ZumiCon wouldn't be getting any financial support from Unlocked or loot and XP for that matter. The con was effectively still at square one, which is a dangerous place to be with less than a month until the event. Tell you what makes it even more dangerous is when you think you're at square one, when you're actually even further back than that. And unfortunately, they didn't know it at the time, but that's exactly where IzumiCon's leadership was at the time. 
Let's go back to that meeting on August 4th. It was becoming increasingly obvious to everyone that the con was having money problems, but nobody had an idea just how bad things truly were. Different people became suspicious of Dez at different times, but this seems to be the turning point where even the people who wanted to believe in Dez were starting to see things differently. And what do I mean by that? Per documentation shared with me by a former IzumiCon director, Dez was the only person with access to IzumiCon's funding. The money made via Eventbrite and Square was forwarded to a bank account owned and operated by her. Nobody else could pull money from it. And worth mentioning, by the way, is that even by the time this meeting happened, Dez already had pulled money from it. More specifically, there's records of her using IzumiCon money on her phone bill, an Amazon Prime subscription, and a car. Allegedly, she justified these purchases by saying that she needed them to run the con, and presumably due to her unemployment, she couldn't afford them without dipping into the con's money. And assuming that's true, then I'm sure then maybe there was some truth to that, and that's probably why nobody really argued with her about it at the time, though silently they were still very concerned. But that can concern became amplified when, in the months leading up to the meeting, Izumi Khan's directors couldn't help but notice that she was posting about stuff like getting some new tattoos and allegedly going on vacations as well. More specifically, their concern centered around how she was suddenly able to afford all these things. So now that you know that, you can probably understand why Izumi Khan's directors felt suspicious of Dez when they allegedly started noticing that money that the Khan should have had simply didn't seem to be there. Furthermore, those that I spoke to about this meeting in detail recalled an incident where two parties had offered to loan Izumi Khan a very significant amount of money under the condition that Dez show them exactly what happened to the money that the Khan had already collected. But Dez, to everyone's immense confusion, wouldn't do it, effectively shutting down Izumi Khan's best chance at getting the money it needed for reasons that nobody could seem to comprehend. In fact, it's been alleged that when people would ask her about about what happened to the money, she'd do anything from giving a dismissive and unspecific answer to saying to talk to her lawyer. Screenshots of conversations Dez had with a then friend around this time show Dez talking about not having to surrender the receipts if she doesn't want to, which she very much doesn't seem like she does. As a matter of fact, she goes so far as to say that she has, quote, nothing to hide right before alluding to something she admitted and didn't hide. Presumably that something is spending Izumi Khan's money. In fact, she'd plainly say in another message to that then friend that she personally spent some money and was honest about it. She claims to have spent $1,800 of the con's money. This is the same amount that surviving documentation given to me by a former IzumiCon director has listed for Dez's claimed expenses. So it's without question then that Dez definitely spent at least $1,800 of the money that was supposed to be going toward IzumiCon. It's impossible to say for absolute certain whether or not she spent more than that, but in light of all the evidence against her, that seemed to be the conclusion that most, if not all of the directors, reached at that meeting. And to be clear, it's a very logical conclusion to reach. Dez was the only person with access to the money, Dez seems to be spending quite a bit of money lately, and Dez already had a proven history of spending money that was meant for the con. You know, you don't exactly need to be Sherlock Holmes for this. But regardless of the specifics of that meeting, everyone seems to have left it feeling a huge sense of dread. The bottom line was that the con didn't have the money that it needed, and even by her own admission, Des had spent at least $1,800 of the money that was supposed to be for the con. The Izumi con directors felt more in the dark about how Des was handling the con's inner workings than ever, and the con was only weeks away. And worst of all, things were still only gonna get worse from here. Everyone that I spoke to about this general time period for the con claims that it's around this time that they stopped getting any kind of contact or response from Dez, that she started ghosting all of them. And sure enough, screenshots of a conversation between Dez and a then friend show Dez saying that she's going dark and getting a lawyer. And looking through my own documentation of the con and other documents that others have shown me, August 6th and 7th 
seem to have been the last few days where contact from the directors to people like panelists or would-be members of the press seemed even somewhat normal. But the directors were trying to navigate an increasingly difficult situation, and very quickly they'd realized that they didn't exactly have a lot of options left. Allegedly, they considered taking out a personal loan to cover the venue, but they soon realized that they wouldn't have money left over for other expenses like hotel rooms, shirts, and badges. One of the directors told me, We couldn't in good conscience allow a supporter to loan the con money when he wasn't likely to get any of it back. So finally, on August 11th, the directors did the only thing they felt they still could. They resigned. According to one of them, in a then-public post they'd make about it almost a week later, all the directors found out something was going on when we were asking what was taking so long to get answers back for our budgets, the quotes we had gotten, and contracts that still hadn't been signed when the owner finally said, Nope, not giving you any info, talk to my lawyer, and went dark. We couldn't get in touch with her for over a week, so we all decided to resign because we didn't want any legal backlash coming back to us for something that was completely out of our control. We aren't part of the LLC that owns AzumiCon. We aren't partners with the owner. We don't have access to any records and can't make any official announcement without the owner's consent because of fear of legal backlash. We're just volunteers. We can't do anything. And so, they edited the website to list all the directorial roles as completely vacant, and with heavy hearts, they washed their hands of this convention. Pretty much the only other signal that anyone else was immediately given that something had happened were resignation emails from directors like Ashley who had to tell their contacts about their resignations, though they weren't specific about the details. One of these emails, however, mentioned that the official announcement would be posted on Monday, August 13th, but that for legal reasons, they wouldn't go into detail on what happened. And speaking of legal reasons, or more specifically the fear of legal ramifications, as was mentioned earlier, that's why nobody in IzumiCon's directorial circle said anything else about this publicly until later on. The con was Dez's responsibility at the end of the day, and with their resignations, they were no longer in a position to speak on behalf of IzumiCon in an official capacity. But despite all this, that still doesn't necessarily mean that they were totally silent about this either. For starters, DC from Loot and XP quickly got contacted by not just one, but two of the newly former directors. The first one to contact him did so via WhatsApp, which he can no longer access, but he did still have screenshots from the second one to contact him. I'll be honest, you don't want to be associated with this con. Not at this point. Trust me on this. With the context of knowing what happened that very day, these are very haunting messages to get. And he wasn't the only one to get messages like these either. Perhaps the most interesting one was reportedly sent to Aslan, SoonerCon's then chairwoman, who recalls Dez seeking her out for advice around this time. More specifically, the precise timing of this conversation is a little fuzzy because she didn't save screenshots, and this conversation took place via text message, so they've long since been deleted, but Amber, more specifically, Sooner Con's director of communications. Yeah, there's a surprising number of Ambers in the local con organizing community, but I digress. This Amber recalls hearing Aslan talking about these messages at the time, and frankly, I'm inclined to believe them both, since the idea that Dez sought advice, especially from Aslan, really doesn't seem too unusual, especially considering not just Dez's inexperience, but also the fact that Dez volunteered at Sooner Con in 2017. In any case, here's what Aslan alleges happened. Based Basically, Dez approached her asking for advice because, well, obviously things weren't going so well. Aslan suggested issuing refunds, getting a lawyer, and filing for bankruptcy. Dez didn't like this idea for two reasons. One, she felt that the con's current problems were her team's fault for leaving, and two, she just didn't have the money to issue refunds. This confused Aslan, and she asked Dez what happened to the money, and sure enough, that's when Dez stopped responding to her as well. But in addition to unique situations like those of DC and Aslan, a handful of miscellaneous people, most of whom were involved in various facets of IzumiCon, received anonymously sourced messages
messages saying that all the directors resigned, but the main one that got spread around to the public was one that was sent out on the 13th, you know, the day that it was believed that Des would make a formal cancellation announcement. Nobody seems to know for an absolute fact just who sent these messages, but given their timing and knowledge of the situation, I think it's a reasonable assumption that it was either one of the directors or perhaps someone close to their circle. But, you know, honestly, it really doesn't matter exactly who sent these messages because regardless of their source, their effect was still the same. These messages in tandem with all the other weird signals that everyone was getting from the con gave the would-be attendees plenty of reasons to start asking questions. Or, you know what, actually, it's more accurate to say that they would have been asking questions if Des had let them. It was around this time that IzumiCon's Eventbrite page stopped letting people buy tickets. People who tried posting in the IzumiCon Facebook group were either having their posts deleted or not approved. Emails were either ignored or given non-answers. And people who wanted to speak directly to the con's registered owner, Ladder Entertainment, were shocked to find that the company was listed as permanently closed. Also suspicious was how IzumiCon's Facebook group for volunteers was renamed and deleted, but I've been told that, at the very least, wasn't Dez's doing. Yeah, that was actually one of the directors. In any case, as you've probably already pieced together. Yeah, despite everything, the 13th came and went without any official word from IzumiCon slash Dez. A few other people made warning posts about the con's inevitable cancellation, and perhaps the most notable among these posts was one made by a then friend of Dez's, one of the newer directors who would have recently resigned, saying that, make no mistake, this con was definitely cancelled, Dez just won't make an announcement until she figures out how to handle the situation. When when exactly that might be, though, they had no idea. At this point, it was painfully obvious for those keeping tabs on the situation that this con was simply dead. With only a few weeks left till the weekend it was supposed to happen, there were no directors, no schedule, no organization, and at the rate they were announcing their own cancellations, pretty soon the con wouldn't have any guests left either. Yeah, let's go ahead and talk about this for just a moment. So, originally, in addition to Justin Nim He's the Silver Power Ranger for Power Rangers in Space. The con was supposed to have five voice guests. There was Morgan Berry, Jade Saxton, J. Michael Tatum, Austin Tyndall, and Barry Yandel. The first two to cancel were J. Michael Tatum and Morgan Berry, who'd been double booked by Sabaton Con and Sack Anime, respectively. Tatum tweeted that he sent his cancellation as early as March, and I've spoken to Morgan Berry, who alleged that she sent hers in as early as February, and that she sent it to both her agent and directly to Dez. And why Dez and not an official guest relations director, you may be wondering. Well, IzumiCon's old guest relations director was among the first few directors to leave once Dez took over, and claims to have left early enough to have zero involvement in any capacity for booking any of the 2018 guests. The con's next official guest relations director claims to have not been given the position until three to four months before the con happened, and according to her, all but one of the con's would-be guests had already been booked by that point. She further claims that she never spoke to Barry or Tatum the entire time she was with the con, something that, A, fits with the idea that Barry and Tatum had sent in their cancellation notices pretty early on and therefore didn't think that they had to talk to someone from the con so many months later, and B, Barry has vouched for this by virtue of alleging that, outside of the unpublished Unlocked interview, that Des was the only person within IzumiCon that she can recall speaking to about her appearance there. So, you know, in short, if these claims are to be believed, and personally I have no reason to doubt them, then that would mean that Des, who we know had previously expressed a lot of interest in guest relations, was acting as the con's unofficial guest relations director in at least some capacity for the majority of the con's planning. You can probably guess what's going to happen next. According to Morgan, Des seemed to prefer communicating with her via Facebook, so she'd send her cancellation notice to Des via a now inaccessible Facebook message sometime in February, and then she'd simply never hear anything from Des ever again. And Tatum's tweets suggest that he had a similar experience, that after allegedly sending in his cancellation notice in March, 
he just wouldn't get a response. Worth noting, by the way, is that he had already been added to Sabaton Khan's guest list as early as January 9th, and as for Morgan, she'd be officially added to Sack Anime's guest list on March 16th. In other words, while we may not have precise dates, it seems extremely evident that both of them would have had to have been aware of their double bookings pretty early on. So the idea that they sent their cancellation notices so early on, yeah, that seems pretty reasonable to me. And yet, despite this, the con wouldn't announce their cancellations and remove them from the site's guest list until July. So what was going on? While Des wasn't the one in charge of editing the website, she didn't seem to tell the person who was that Barry and Tatum needed to be removed from the guest list until mid-June. I asked a few guest relations staffers from various cons about how long it usually takes to announce guest cancellations, and I was told that a lot of it will depend on things like the reason for the cancellation, the size of the con, the gravity of the guest, how soon it is before the con, you know, plenty of variables that make this question really tricky to answer. That they happen as soon as possible, nonetheless, seemed to be the go-to answer. And that although that can mean different things to different cons depending on the circumstances, taking weeks, let alone months, to announce a known guest cancellation is a hundred percent not normal. Kat Callahan, a journalist who covers anime in Japan more generally and has served in various con positions, including guest relations positions from the late 90s to the mid 2010s, speculated about it. Assuming this was a major guest, I would speculate, without significant evidence to the contrary, that such a delay would be to avoid hemorrhaging refunds. In a screenshot of a conversation between Dez and a then friend, Dez can be seen asking for help because the talent agent knows that Tatum and Barry cancelled months ago and is saying that not announcing their cancellations earlier is fraudulent. To which Dez says, which is true, but not in a sketchy way like everybody's gonna think. You know, as though there's a non-sketchy, non-fraudulent reason to not announce guest cancellations that you already knew about. She goes on to allege that while there were several factors involved in the delayed cancellation announcement, the main one is wanting to book a replacement guest, which didn't work out. She alleges that her contact subordinate, who had been managing negotiations for a prospective replacement guest, suddenly quit, and it's therefore the fault of the agency. Whether or not there's any truth to this, I couldn't verify. But just so we're clear, even if that is true, it does not stop the fact that her not announcing the cancellation sooner is still, well, false advertising and fraudulent. And their cancellations should have been announced with or without a replacement. But ultimately, Barry and Tatum wouldn't get removed from the site's guest list until sometime between July 1st and 6th. And for reasons I can only speculate, the announcement wouldn't get made till July 14th via a Facebook post and then a tweet about it on July 30th. So it was way later than it should have been, but at long last, the general public finally knew that neither Morgan Berry nor J. Michael Tatum would be at the con. And interestingly, the public weren't the only ones finally learning about these cancellations either. The new guest relations director claims that she had no idea that either Barry or Tatum had cancelled until she saw the Facebook post about it. In other words, that their cancellations weren't just news to the con's community, but also to her, you know, the con's guest relations director. Hopefully you don't need me to tell you how much of a massive red flag that is. You didn't see just like red flags, you did like a tour of the plant where they make the red flags. <laughs> so yeah, the bottom line here is that it seems as though Des was acting as the con's unofficial guest relations director in some capacity for several months. Tatum and Barry both claim to have sent their cancellation notices several months in advance, and despite this, Des didn't seem to make any moves to let the public know about this until June, and it wouldn't be until July that the website was updated and the announcements were posted. So... Yeah, in conclusion, yikes. But the whole behind the scenes mess aside, the announcement still happened before AzumiCon's deeper problems would become apparent to the public. So while people were disappointed to hear about Barry and Tatum's cancellations, of course, nobody really thought too deeply about it at the time. On the 31st, the con announced that Damon Mills, the last guest to have a contract drawn up and the only one that the newer guest relations director claims to have booked, would be guesting at the con. So, you know, seemingly everything was still moving 
moving on track as far as the public was concerned. But then, fast forward about two weeks to August 13th, Jade Saxton announced that she had to cancel her appearance at IzumiCon because of some recent issues. This was, of course, after everyone noticed that all the directors walked out, so yeah, it was pretty easy to guess what those issues probably were. This was also the same day that Damon Mills posted some interesting tweets about being frustrated about cons that ghosted their guests, so, you know, eyes emoji. Also interesting is that Justin Nimmo replied to these tweets asking Damon if he's heard anything from IzumiCon, which I can only assume he hadn't because sure enough, the next day, Damon would end up canceling his appearance at IzumiCon as well, citing recent issues that were out of his control. The writing was on the wall at this point. This con is beyond saving. It is completely and utterly dead. And after two more long days of wondering what IzumiCon was gonna try to do next, the con finally announced its cancellation on August 16th. The announcement came in the form of a Facebook post blaming logistical difficulties, talent scheduling, and other factors beyond our control. So, you know, it blames every possible thing but Dez. As a side note, by the way, it is a really, really good thing that word spread about this post pretty fast because none of the con's other platforms, which most significantly included its own website, would be updated to reflect this change. As a matter of fact, rather than get updated, the website was just completely taken down at least two weeks later. And while hardly anyone knew the details of why this was happening, they really didn't need to in order to know that this was just complete and utter bullshit. And I'll tell you who that was especially true for was the talent that Des tried blaming this cancellation on at least partially. Yeah, rightfully so. Some of the cons would be guests and a few other voice actors who heard about what was going on were among those clapping back at Des slash IzumiCon's thin veiled excuse. But the question of exactly why the con was being cancelled was quickly overshadowed by the question of refunds. The idea that this whole thing might have just been a misunderstanding was completely shattered when some people started noticing that the event date was quietly changed on Eventbrite to the 16th. To be more specific, the change would have had to have happened sometime between August 12th and 20th, and it would have had to have been made by someone with access to the event Bright account. Per surviving documentation of a former IzumiCon director, said account was in Des and Ladder Entertainment's name, registered to Ladder Entertainment's email, which was owned and operated by Des, and linked to Des's bank account. In other words, the Eventbrite account wasn't so much meant for IzumiCon's team as it was just for Des. And while it's possible that there might have been a few other directors who previously had some access to the account, they would have already resigned by the time the changes would have had to have been made and none of them stood to benefit from making a change like this anyways. Dez, on the other hand, did. So, in short, it is extremely, remarkably reasonable to believe that Dez is the one who made this change. The odds of anyone else having both the means and motivation to have done this, and all without being switched back by Dez later, are impossibly low. The timing of when this change would have been made is slightly debatable, but if nothing else, it can't be argued that it happened after people started catching on that the con wasn't going to be happening, and during a super close proximity to the cancellation announcement itself. But you know, details aside, the bottom line here is nonetheless that well, this change happened. And this is important because the new date made it so that Eventbrite thought that, well, the event had already happened by the time people started requesting refunds, which, as I'm sure you can imagine, only made the refund process more difficult for the would-be attendees. But luckily, this roadblock ultimately didn't work, and people who bought their badges via Eventbrite were eventually able to get refunds via Eventbrite. But while the refunds were officially from Eventbrite, whether the money used to provide these refunds funds came from the pockets of Eventbrite or Dez isn't 100% clear. Still though, the fact that this didn't work out in Dez's favor should not take away from the fact that it's still a roadblock that she almost certainly placed. Check this out, you can even see it in the refund emails, scheduled to occur August 16th, 2018, even though the event was actually scheduled for August 31st through September 2nd, 
But despite how scummy that was, the would-be attendees were ultimately the lucky ones since they were still able to get refunds eventually. Unfortunately, the vast majority of the cons would-be artists and vendors weren't so fortunate. I reached out to several artists who bought tables at IzumiCon 2018, and most of them alleged that they didn't receive any refund of any kind. And in case you don't know how much of a big deal that is, Emmy Jane Arts told me I had bought my booth in an extra pass, which totaled to about $200. A huge loss as I had already spent money on my merch. So yeah, a number of artists and vendors turned to their banks instead, and while there were a few people who were successful in getting a refund this way, they were still the minority. Fury Starcat, for example, alleged, Yeah, I tried to file with my bank, who told me to file with PayPal, who told me to file with the bank. I eventually gave up. The story seemed to be much the same for the vendors as well, that nobody received a refund via IzumiCon itself, but a few lucky vendors like Norman's One Stop Anime were able to get them through their banks. That being said, there was one vendor who had spent $440 on her table and landed on the local news because of this whole thing. In the news story, she talks about the money that she spent on her table and that when she sent an email to the con about a refund, the reply she got was, we have funds tied up in deposits and prepaid expenses as well. It's also mentioned that she filed a police report, though unfortunately nothing ever really seemed to come of that. And although there were definitely a lot of people interested in the possibility of one, and at least one person who was interested enough to actually contact the lawyer, ultimately nobody ever filed the lawsuit, said the person who contacted a lawyer when asked about why they didn't go through with it. The cost for the lawyer was exponentially more than what I lost or could recuperate. I would have had to get many more people to join me in the suit, and that just didn't come together. So I just filed it as a loss and knew never to pay with a check again. But back to this article, the news station reached out to Des for a comment, but surprise, surprise, they didn't get a response. Yeah, shocking, I know. While Des never commented about the state of the IzumiCon money, someone who was close to her up until this whole thing happened offered their insights to all the concerned would-be con-goers at the time about what they believed happened to the money. Obviously, this can't be 100% verified, but they alleged that Des had already spent the money on herself and on getting a lawyer, and that at least at the time of all this unfolding, regarded herself as a victim in this whole thing. Are you sure about that? The IzumiCon Facebook group was deleted a few days later, and while the precise timing isn't clear, the IzumiCon Facebook page was deleted sometime after the group was deleted, but before September 4th. Nonetheless, with the page in the group deleted, so too were plenty of valuable posts that could have offered more evidence, insights, or clarity into the finer details of this whole situation deleted too. It's presumed that Des would have had to have been the one to delete the page and group, or at the very least perhaps requesting it, being indifferent to or okay with it, or something else to that effect. And speaking of deleted content, it was a bit before this, it was sometime in the middle of August, but it was around that time that Des purged her main personal account. Not only did this shut down one of the quickest ways to contact her, but also it effectively closed the only window that most of IzumiCon's staff and leadership had into her life. A window that, for many, is still closed to this day. There have been a few brief and inconsequential Des sightings over the years, but other than that, nobody that I spoke to seems to know what she's been doing for the past few years. But that being said, one person that I spoke to, Des's former friend that I've mentioned a number of times throughout this video, showed me a message from Des in October of 2021, in which Des still doesn't seem to be taking responsibility for what happened. And in fact, this message really adds credence to the idea that Des thinks of herself as the victim in this whole thing, as she spends a lot of time talking about feeling betrayed. Interestingly, she also mentions that certain people will probably never know the truth about what happened in IzumiCon due to NDAs and a certain lawyer con owner, which is almost certainly a reference to Faisal. That being said, an earlier message from Des to this former friend shows Des saying that there's no NDAs in place for former directors, and certainly nobody that I spoke to claimed to be under NDA, so whether perhaps there are some NDAs in place that I'm unaware of, Des is lying so that she doesn't have to talk about IzumiCon, or perhaps something else altogether, I have absolutely no idea.
When asked about why Dez was ever allowed to get the con in the first place, Faisal said, Marlon knew her and said she wanted to keep the con going. No clue if there was any more thought on his part. I didn't really know her, so I had no opinion. We'll probably never know for sure whether the act of selling the con to Dez was an act of blind trust, sabotage, desperation, optimism, ignorance, manipulation, a mix of all of them, or maybe even something else entirely. But whatever it was, I wouldn't blame you for feeling like, you know, maybe in some ways Dez was being set up to fail. Because in some ways she was. The contract from which she got the con didn't exactly leave her with an abundance of resources, and self-inflicted money problems or not, that almost certainly would have made the con smaller that year than it had been in a long time. These are obstacles that a more seasoned con organizer probably could have overcome, of course, but if I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times. Des lacked experience. But the ways in which you could argue she was set up to fail do not excuse her for what she did. They just don't. She was not, in any way, set up for single-handedly destroying the con before it even happened. That is entirely, 100% on her. Regardless of whether or not it was a good contract, the fact of the matter is that she still chose to sign it. She chose to take on the responsibility of AzumiCon, and she failed. And while I think there's a fair point to be made in the argument that the root cause of all this was the haste and lack of vetting that went on in the search for a new owner, AzumiCon's meltdown was, nonetheless, Dez's fault first and foremost. And here we are several years later and she still never so much as acknowledged her massive role in Izumi-Khan's failure, not publicly at least. And as for privately? Well, one of the people that I spoke to knew someone who still had a way to contact Dez despite no longer being close to her, and they reached out to that person asking if they could get me and Dez in contact with each other. This came in the form of them messaging Dez, possibly with just a screenshot of our mutual contact telling them that a YouTuber was trying to get in contact with Dez for a video about the fall of AzumiCon, but I don't know that for 100% sure. What I do know for sure, however, is that on the next day, Dez either deleted or locked down her Facebook profile and when I asked the person if I could see a screenshot of what they sent her, they wouldn't send one to me because they didn't feel comfortable sharing their private texts. A few months pass, and after a while, I notice that Des revives her Facebook account again. In the interest of due diligence, I message her myself this time. I never got a scene receipt, but I still think she definitely saw it, because sometime after I sent her this message, she definitely blocked me this time. So whatever Des may have to say about what happened to Izumi Khan and why, well, we may never know. Shortly after everyone had their collective moment to vent their frustrations, several members of the community decided to go ahead and take matters into their own costumed hands. And so several anime events were planned across the metro during the weekend that AzumiCon was meant to happen. One Stop Anime, for example, hosted an Artist Alley sampler event. Jovial Hearts Cosplay hosted an event called Alt Party at Griffin Community Park, which was sort of like a small convention in its own right, you know, the okay KCT Club came by and sold drinks and snacks, there were panels, there was a cosplay contest, a raffle, and so much more. But the biggest event was by far the Ripizumi party at the Will Rogers Gardens and main event, which was orchestrated by Divine Creations Cosplay, Honor Leechy, and Lo-Fi Kai. Kai told me about the event. Ripizumi was two parts. We had the photo shoot opportunity at the Will Rogers Gardens, and then the party itself at main event with the costume contest. Anyone with one of our wristbands got a $10 play card for free. We had a whole bunch of donors. It went really well, and I think we had about 100 people at main event. I honestly think people loved it. We got a lot of great feedback from it, and we had a lot of fun. Christopher Parker, the owner of Red Dirt 3D, added to that, for what it was, it turned out amazing. The other events that went on, organized and run by other cosplayers, saw good numbers too. It was a nice distraction from the reality of what happened to the convention. And sure enough, that reality didn't leave the community's collective consciousness after these events finished up. In fact, it was very much the opposite. And there are two things I'm referring to when I say that. The first is something I think SoonerCon's former chair and current president of the Future Society of Central Oklahoma, 
Aslan, succinctly summarized when I asked her about the effect Izumi Khan's untimely end had on the local con going scene, and that was it drives up the cost of producing cons, which are costs passed on to the attendees, pricing people out who might otherwise participate if they could afford to, making the con environment less inclusive. It makes it so celebrities and vendors don't want to do business in our state for the poor reputation of events that don't pay their talent and where there are too few attendees for vendors to turn a profit. It sows discord and needlessly disappoints people. The second thing I'm referring to, and this kind of feeds into what Aslan said, is that 2019 was also a horrendous year for anime conventions in Oklahoma. Now, before I go more into detail on that, let me give you a bit of context. Namely, let's talk about Oklahoma anime con problems before IzumiCon versus after, and I want to take a brief moment to emphasize that I'm only talking about anime cons here, you know, not general pop culture cons, comic cons, sci-fi cons, and so on. Anyways, 20 2016 and 17 saw the collapse of two much smaller anime conventions that were trying to start up, and those were Otaku Homa and Otaku Matsuri, respectively. And while I couldn't find any concrete information about what happened to Otaku Homa, there really wasn't a whole lot of concern over its failure anyways, since the con was just so small. Like, literally, the artists and vendors, which, you know, probably encompasses less than 15 people, were all put in the same room where panelists would be presenting at the front. The whole room was, oh, about the size of a classroom, and then the room next to it was set up to be a cafe, and that was it. That was actually the whole con. Yeah, as you can imagine, attendance was not great, but Otaku Matsuri, on the other hand, yeah, that one caused a lot of concern. So, from the outside looking in, Otaku Matsuri was a pretty well put together con with a really solid guest list. The attendance, one could easily surmise, would probably be pretty good. But according to the con's director, while the con had anticipated an attendance of around 1200 people, 150 pre-regged, if even that many. Nonetheless, the con was scheduled to be held in Norman, Oklahoma the weekend after IzumiCon 2017. But against all odds, yet another ice storm was forecast to hit the weekend that the con was supposed to happen, prompting Oklahoma's then governor to declare a state of emergency the day before the con was supposed to happen. So effectively, it was canceled right then and there, though the director told me that they also, quote, had issues with the hotel changing our payment schedule. They did not want to elaborate on what precisely that meant. But regardless, speaking of payment, like IzumiCon, refunds would end up being a point of contention for the would-be attendees and participants of Otaku Matsuri. In fact, so many people felt reminded of Otaku Matsuri when all the IzumiCon 2018 stuff started coming to light that a few rumors had spread that Dez was involved with Otaku Matsuri as well. That being said, nobody who I spoke to who was involved with Otaku Matsuri recalls her having any involvement with it. My guess is therefore that Dez wasn't involved with Otaku Matsuri and that these rumors were probably just the byproduct of people getting confused since the two situations did have some resemblance. But to get back to the matter of refunds, it was neither a quick nor easy process. The director alleges that everyone should have got them within a few months, and I spoke to a few people who were eligible to receive refunds from Otaku Matsuri, and all but one of them claimed that they eventually got a refund, but that the key word is eventually. Artists and vendors, in particular, seem to have waited for quite a while, with some getting theirs within the original 45 day window that the con promised, some getting theirs slightly after that, and others not getting theirs till several months later or in installments. Nonetheless, albeit after a significant wait, they still did get their refunds. Or at the very least, that was the case for everyone that I spoke to about it, except for one anonymous would-be volunteer. An archive of Otaku Matsuri's site says that volunteers would have to register for the con and that they'd be reimbursed later. As a side note, however, a separate would-be volunteer claims that not every single volunteer had to do this. Nonetheless, the first one that I mention alleges that they went through this process and that they never received reimbursement. So this is all to say that the fallout of Otaku Matsuri's cancellation, you know, it was nowhere near as bad as, say, Izumi cons would end up being, but the whole thing was still pretty messy. And that 
seems to be at the heart of why Otaku Matsuri still hasn't, and almost certainly never will, resurface. Said the director about its potential revival, I moved out of state after marital issues, and since I believe, based on conversations very similar to the aggressive version of these questions, that the cancellation left a bad taste in everyone's mouth. We all felt defeated and rough, so the convention will never come back. I'll admit, I'm more a convention vendor more than I am a convention director, and even my confidence got shaken to the core of the whole thing. So that's interesting and all sure, but why am I telling you about all this? Well, it's because I want you to understand that by the time AzumiCon 2018 happened, there were some people feeling pessimistic about the state of anime cons in Oklahoma, and AzumiCon's meltdown really seemed to validate and amplify a lot of that pessimism. Whether or not they realized it, that effectively put a pretty big task on the shoulders of Oklahoma's anime cons of 2019. You know, they had to prove to everyone that everything would be fine and that, well, even if AzumiCon wasn't around anymore, everything would still be okay. You know, they still had their gathering spots and a space where they could express their love of anime. You know, hope was not lost. Or at least... That's what should have happened, like, in theory. In practice, the two Oklahoma anime cons that happened in 2019 were also pretty controversial and really didn't do anything except validate and amplify that pessimism even more. The first of those cons was Tokyo and Tulsa 2019, which has been lovingly dubbed by its attendees Hobby Lobby Con. And why Hobby Lobby Con, you may ask? Well, to briefly summarize what happened, TNT had to get a new venue in 2019 since its usual venue was undergoing some renovations. So they got a venue in the nearby city of Broken Arrow, but then two weeks before the con, the venue changed their terms, thereby forcing TNT to have to suddenly choose between putting their artist alley outside in the middle of the hot Oklahoma summer or putting it in a dimly lit and only partially air-conditioned building that was once a Hobby Lobby. So yeah, the choice they made is quite obvious, and while this was definitely a step up from an outdoor artist alley, this Hobby Lobby was still incredibly unsafe, and that's to say nothing of how distant it was from the rest of the con. Like, literally, the con had to shuttle people there in school buses since it was just so far off. But anyways, the building was incredibly dusty, people recorded there being loose screws everywhere, there was open wiring, dripping water, dim lighting, and despite all this, and the ridiculously short notice TNT gave their artists about this, alas, there were still no refunds to be granted to any artists who wanted to skip out on this con upon hearing about the change in venue. But anyways, since the state of the artist Sally was just so abysmal, one artist, Ella Fluff, made a joke on Twitter that people should ghost the con, and then shortly after that, the con told her that she'd have to leave for breaking her contract, and how exactly she did that, they never said. Yeah, the whole thing was definitely sketchy, and not just because it was about an artist's alley. No, but for real, puns aside, the sketchy nature of the whole incident was actually big enough that it landed on the local news. The whole clip is about uh, two and a half minutes long, but here's an excerpt that pretty much sums it up. I joked with a couple people about uh, having them sneak in instead of paying for their tickets, which I accept was a uh, flaw on my part. Shori says Saturday afternoon, she was told to leave. She actually broke the rules of her contract. Shori says she didn't know of any rules she broke, and the founder of Tokyo in Tulsa, James Fowler, wouldn't comment on what exactly she did wrong. So in a nutshell, that was TNT 2019, and if you want a less brief summary of why this con was such a complete disaster, then Square One Cosplay has an hour-long vlog that really captures just how chaotic this convention was, and you can see the buses, the venue, you can see everything I mentioned. I'll leave a link in the description for anyone interested, but in the meantime, here's a little highlight reel. Huh? It was so unsafe, it was so unsanitary, mm. the staff was rude, it was cramped, it was cramped. It was hot. They it was hard hair to, to go which... anywhere. Oh no. Oh dear. Is everybody waiting for the shuttles? Oh no. Waiting for the shuttle? Oh no. So we just had to leave as soon as we came in. We just got here and the fire alarm went off. What just happened? So everyone's told to evacuate the building. All the vendors had to get their own lighting because otherwise you can't really see their wares. So They 
did have some bag checks and stuff at the Hobby Lobby. They had some like bag and security checks or whatever. There was none at the main building. No, that's Absolutely so dangerous. None. Where that's there's so, so many people. Dangerous. Where all the panels were and everything, none. none. All the guests, no. none. none. I never saw anybody get their bag checked. The I never had a bag got, checked. None of that. A Zoomy con that happened here. Mm -hmm. That has already happened here. Learn from that. You know better, mm -hmm. and you know that can happen to you. You're not big enough for that not to happen to you. So yep. just learn better, fix it, and just do do better. <laughs> The next anime convention to happen in Oklahoma was the aptly titled Anime Oklahoma. I cannot emphasize enough that what I'm about to give you is the condensed version of the story because it's really long and there's still a lot of details that are fuzzy. Nonetheless, I'm gonna do what I can. So, Anime Oklahoma started out as a very grassroots con and it needed funding. And while I'm still not 100% sure how and when this happened, at some stage word got out that a man named Steven was involved. But the problem here is that, one, I don't want to derail this video by going into detail about this, but suffice to say, Steven isn't exactly just some random guy that nobody knew about. And two, he was also pretty involved in a remarkably unsuccessful con called Godaiko Con 2017. Honestly, I could make a totally separate video on this con if I wanted to because there's no shortage of things to talk about with this one as well. There were plenty of things that made Godaiko Con 2017 unsuccessful, but to sum it up, among plenty of other problems, like being scheduled the same weekend as a well-known local cosplay event, Yomacon's Cosplay Beach Party, radio silence from the con's leadership, and using a venue that was largely disliked by the local community because of how they'd cancelled Midwest Media Expo earlier that year, by far the most discussed problem this con had was attendance. To be more specific, it's been very widely alleged that the con promised artists and vendors anywhere from several hundreds to at least a thousand people in attendance, and tables were priced accordingly. But the actual turnout was ridiculously low, leaving the artists and vendors struggling to so much as break even, let alone make a profit. For example, one of the artists who was present, Bold Egoist, alleges that she paid $125 for her table and recalls barely breaking even. She told me about the price, quote, For a three-day con to charge $125, it should have had at least 1,200 unique attendants or 3 to 5,000 turnstile. If I had to guess how many people were at GodaikoCon 2017, I'd say 120 including staff. It was a very dull crowd. Shoujo Havoc, another artist who was there, also alleges that she paid $125 for her table and can't remember whether or not she broke even, but said that if she did, then it wasn't by much. She further alleged that there were friends of hers in the artist alley who most certainly did not have that same luck. She further recalled to me, quote, If I had to guess, it was maybe a couple hundred in attendance, maybe? At one point during the show, one of the vendors, artists, I don't remember who it was, went around with a paper getting signatures from other vendors and artists to try to get a refund on the table costs from the head due to the false advertising. They brought the list up to the head and they were told we'd see compensation, a check in the mail I believe, from the artist alley head, but it never came. Ah. What a terrible con. Oh, <laughs> the signatures. Yeah, you cannot talk about GoDaikoCon 2017 and not talk about the walkout. So here is what happened. So outraged by the fact that the con had promised at least a thousand people in attendance and they're just, oh God, to call it a ghost town would have been generous. Like, dear Lord, this might be the saddest rave I've ever seen. Except for Greg Ayers, actually. Uh, he looks like he's having a great time. Anyways, a fair-sized group of the con's artists approached Steven together in an attempt to get a refund. There's video footage of this confrontation happening, which I have seen, but the videos are unlisted and I haven't been able to get in contact with the uploader, so unfortunately I have no idea whether or not they'd want me to show it in this video. Nonetheless, know that the video footage of this confrontation exists and that it's it certainly doesn't paint Steven in a good light. It was exactly 25, $25. And that, I think that's ridiculous if the tables were like 300, 200? 300. Three, that's... Like, like 300, 200 plus like, it's like per table. So like if you have several tables set up for like several things, then you have an easy 500, 600 almost seven hundred dollars right there and then you get you only get twenty five dollars back plus you got to think about all of the money that they spent 
to get here to, like first to get here second to make the products that they're selling it just doesn't seem fair that they get only 25 like they could do they could get more yeah like, at least something of what they put in to get here absolutely and I understand that everything needs to make profit but to treat those that aim to give the con pleasure and give the con profit like trash just didn't feel right. Worth noting, by the way, is that one of the artists told me that they flat out declined the refund in the interest of pursuing a case with PayPal. In fact, that artist, Sugri Symbiote, was present during the confrontation with Steven, and she alleged that she went back to talk to him personally later, as she was experiencing a lot of medical problems at the time and was hoping that she could perhaps get him to understand why $25 simply wasn't enough. In her own words, that was a huge mistake. She alleges that someone believed to be Steven sister started taking pictures of her without permission during this talk. Something that can only generously be described as completely unnecessary. Whether or not Steven asked this person to take photos isn't known, but if nothing else, he allegedly didn't seem to do anything to stop this overtly creepy act. And of course, the cherry on top of this is that ultimately, nothing really ever came of this discussion anyways. Sugary Symbiote alleges to have never got a refund of any kind and has since vowed to not work with him ever again. And again, there were more problems with the con than all this, like, oh my god, I haven't even mentioned the Godaiko con flyer bombing at the cosplay beach party. What's up, buddy? How you doing? Good, how about you? Yeah, hey man, who got time to? <laughs> yeah, well that's how it really goes. I know, right? Yep. Hey, this is Con Ops, right? Yeah, this is Con Ops. They're not here yet. Oh, that's all cool. Hey, just wanted to return that. Oh, cool. Thank you. Yep, thanks again for coming to Cosplay Beach Party. Yep. If you want to learn more about this con, then I'd encourage you to seek out the people who are actually there and to talk to them about it. That being said, if you nonetheless would be interested in seeing me make a video about this con, especially if you were actually there, then by all means let me know, because like I just said, there's definitely no shortage of things to talk about when it comes to GoDaikoCon 2017, but for now, at least, I don't want to spend much more time talking about this con since it's not really our main topic right now, but god, I mean, y'all know me, I just cannot resist the sweet siren song of a good tangent, so yeah, suffice to say, GoDaikoCon 2017 was a train wreck, Steven was involved, and knowing that he was so involved with this train wreck of a con in tandem with his horrible reputation, yeah, it didn't exactly inspire optimism in Anime Oklahoma's potential attendees. It also didn't escape notice that a man called Hightower was listed as a moderator in the con staff group, and this worried a number of people. In light of all this information, in particular about Steven, the con basically said, hey, it's all good, we had no idea, but you know, now that we do, they're gone. Instead, we're gonna get our money from a GoFundMe. JK, we found a new investor, everything's cool now, so uh, yeah. Carry on. But when people started asking about the new investor, not only was there no clear answer given, but at least one person was responded to with a legal threat. Many worried that this meant that Steven was still funding the con since, I mean, it's hard to imagine another reason why they'd respond so explosively. Things escalated to the point where Anime Oklahoma's Facebook page was completely gone for a while, and they'd later claimed that it was because their page got hacked. A claim which... Absolutely nobody believed. Even during the weekend of the event, the question on everyone's collective mind still didn't have an answer. Were Steven and Hightower actually gone? I mean, you know, the con said they're gone, right? So if they really are, then why is the con continuing to dodge the question? Footage from the dealer's room reveals booths that a number of people believe belongs to or are connected with Hightower and Steven. Hightower's booth is pretty visually distinct, and it's kind of blurry, but the one at the top very much looks like his. I'm less sure about the booth believed to be Steven's, as we don't exactly have a great view of it here, but at least in my opinion, god, I don't know, it looks like it might be his, 
or it might not be. Again, it's just really hard for me to tell at this angle. In any case, to the farthest of my knowledge, nobody reported sightings of either Steven or Hightower personally at the con when it finally happened. I attempted to get in contact with Steven, AOK's original owner, and the owner after them to get answers for this whole thing. The first owner told me to contact the second owner, and when I said that I was looking for insights from around the time that the original owner was in charge, they stopped responding. The second owner simply never responded to me at all. And as for Steven, he claimed that he wasn't at AOK -okay and that the booth in the screenshot wasn't his businesses. Furthermore, he alleged that he was going to invest money only and that he wasn't supposed to deal with any day-to-day -day operations, but that was withdrawn. However, a would-be staffer has alleged that at some stage, Steven did want some control over security, which led to this would-be staffer's resignation. This same would-be staffer alleged that Hightower was the one making legal threats using AOK's page. The closest thing to an answer that I've seen AOK give about the new investor was in a comment at the time, in which they alleged that multiple investors have heard about the convention's issues, and a few are interested in signing a contract to come and help support this first year and take over the show. In this same comment, they mentioned that the then-current director was stepping down, and in a follow-up comment, they also claimed that the incoming director asked Hightower to step down, and that he did so. Like I said at the beginning, I cannot emphasize enough that this is just the condensed version of the story, and while I would love to go into more detail, there's still just so much vagueness about this situation that it's really hard for me to do so without more clear information. In any case, in a nutshell, that was the controversy surrounding AOK -okay 2019. So, yeah, after IzumiCon's implosion, things were not great for Oklahoma anime cons, and it made it that much harder to forget that IzumiCon went out the way it did. It felt like we might be feeling the reverberations of its untimely end for, god, who knows how long. But for as chaotic as 2019 was for Oklahoma con goers, it would, of course, be nowhere near as big as what was to follow. I'm sure I don't need to go into detail when I say that the pandemic changed everything for several people, and as far as anime cons go, most, or certainly all the responsible ones, I am looking directly at you, Okicon. Yeah, do not think that I forgot how close you came to hosting an event in 2020. Anyways, the responsible cons didn't host events for most of 2020 and 21. And by 2022, the pandemic had changed so many aspects of life, let alone con going, that it's become increasingly difficult to see what is or feels different because of the pandemic, and what is or feels different because of the lingering ghost of Azumicon. That being said, I would like to end this section on a positive note, so I will say that Tokyo in Tulsa, which is now called Tokyo OK, is undoubtedly the Oklahoma anime con that I've seen the most improvement in post-pandemic. Some backstory with me in this con, I went most years between 2008, which was its first official year, and 2014. I stopped going after that because I usually do panels at cons, and Tulsa is a bit of a journey for me, so badge reimbursement was a really big part of the equation for me, and their panelist reimbursement policy was pretty garbage for a while, so combined with the distance, it just was not gonna happen. But although their panelist reimbursement still definitely has room for improvement, I do see it being notably better than it was in previous years. And look at that, they're at a proper venue again. You know, I see them making positive steps and I want to commend them for that. Right now, they are without question the most stable of Oklahoma's anime cons, and I definitely feel a lot more confidence in TOK now than I have in a very, very long time. When asked about the possibility that Azumicon could return, Faisal told me, I don't think Azumicon will return. I still don't have the time or energy, and Dez is still the owner of the name and IP. Seeing as how Azumicon's absence is likely to be permanent, some local cons that aren't specifically anime-focused have done a great job of stepping up and picking up the pieces that Azumicon left behind. For example, Amber, again, SoonerCon's director of communications, told me, when Azumicon ended, some of those 
those who volunteered and worked on that convention joined SoonerCon's ranks, and we dedicated more resources to anime programming. We placed more budget into anime voice actors and other anime-related guests, listening to the community for who they'd like to see. We've worked on various panels and content geared toward anime fans like tees, idols, J-fashion, floor cosplay contests, skits, trivia, and games. While we will never be an anime convention, we strive to be a convention that brings all types of fandoms together. We hope we can fill a role for our anime community and they find other things to love about our convention as well. So with all that being said, I hope IzumiCon's story is a worthwhile cautionary tale. There's plenty of lessons to be learned here and I'd hate to see some other city lose its local con because of something like this. Furthermore, I also hope that I've cleared the names of IzumiCon's former directors. They really don't deserve to have all the hard work they put into IzumiCon invalidated just because of one tumultuous year that really wasn't their fault, so I urge you to keep that in mind if you ever think about them. And as for Dez, as far as I can tell, IzumiCon 2018 seems to have been her last attempt at running a major event of any kind, or at the very least, that's the case as of when this video is being made. You know, one of the questions without answers that's still being discussed and debated a lot among people who are involved with the ZumiCon is the question of to what degree was what happened to the con purposefully planned? Like, had Des been knowingly laying the foundation for a Machiavellian plot to eliminate the con since day one? Was she painfully naive about the con organizing process and caught up in her own web of lies? Or, you know, maybe Maybe was she somewhere in between? Although everyone certainly has their own theories about it, the facts still remain obscure. And more than any other detail that I mentioned in this video, this is one that I think is going to remain a mystery until, or rather unless, Dez ever decides to take responsibility and do right by IzumiCon's community. As for whether or not I think she'll ever do that, I really don't know. But for what it's worth, I really and truly hope that she does. Oklahoma's con-going community is owed an apology and an explanation from her, not to mention refunds for the people who still haven't got them. Simply put, it's just the right thing to do, and truly, I hope that she realizes that, and even if she needs a little more time, I really hope that she acts on it. But in the meantime, you can rest assured that regardless of whether or not Dez is aware of why what she did was wrong, a large portion of the local con-going community, and even some people in the nationwide con-running community, are. For example, an anonymous con staffer from the East Coast told me, Yeah, I recall a Zoomy con being discussed in a few con organizer corners with a mix of what the heck is going on here and yeah, this is a case study in what not to do reactions. If anything, it was just sort of a surprise that a con that had been around for a while would have this big a collapse. I can't speak for Dez specifically, but there are definitely some names that pop up when con runners talk to each other where they're not looked highly on. Some are cautionary tales, some are known bad actors who do questionable stuff that many of us wonder how they haven't gotten into financial trouble from poorly managing events or had a backlash from attendees. With a few exceptions, most con runners want to see other conventions succeed because we can learn from each other and make our own events better. No one con does everything perfectly. When one convention has a spectacular failure like that, it hurts the general public's trust in all conventions, even if there is no overlap in staff. So yeah, bottom line here is that I for one have a hard time imagining that any con is going to knowingly put Dez in a leadership position anytime soon, and that goes double, nay, triple for any cons in Oklahoma. But anyways, I wanted to mention that radioactive status within the con organizing community and the fact that Dez doesn't currently seem to be active in con organizing because I really and truly do not want y'all to try and seek out Dez, her friends, or her family and harass them about this. Not only is that just a crappy thing to do in general, but, you know, frankly, since she doesn't seem to be active in con organizing anymore, it just wouldn't really accomplish anything. But if you really want to do something meaningful to help make the con running scene a better place, I'd urge you to instead do something like making a point of no longer attending the cons where problematic organizers are still active. Listen, I'm not playing little legal games with little angry men. Um, use the 5G that coronavirus gave us to Google it. I, uh, 
has the spelling for his name been there? Has it been there the whole time? Gotta get rid of that. So, God, on that note, I think I've said just about everything I wanted to say. I can't put into words how cathartic this was to work on and how unbelievable it is that it's actually done now. I want to thank everyone who helped me with this video because just as there's a lot of info in this video, there's a lot of people who spoke to me, shared their insights, their screenshots, their photos, and so much more. A lot of the information in this video has never seen the public before, so this video wouldn't even be a fraction of how great it is now if it weren't for all the wonderful people who replied to my weird and out of the blue messages about AzumiCon. So, you know, again, to all of you who replied and took the time to tell me about your experiences. Thank you so, 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 so much. I'd like to offer some especially big thanks to all the former IzumiCon directors who helped with this video, some of whom really went above and beyond in helping me out. From the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you all not just for your help with this video, but also for making IzumiCon a wonderful con year after year. I think it goes without saying that neither you, nor the con, nor its attendees deserve what Des did to the con, but you, the directorial team, especially didn't deserve it. You all did such a fantastic job with this con, so again, thank you so, so very much. I'd also like to thank all of you, my wonderful viewers, for your absolutely profound level of patience for this video. You know, it took me way longer to make this than I ever expected when I originally set out to make it, but y'all have been very patient with me, and I'm very grateful for that, so thank you, all of you, for that. And finally, I hope I've answered the questions of anyone who was supposed to go to this con, because as I'm sure you've noticed, it made a pretty lasting impact on everyone who was even sort of involved. Like I mentioned earlier, a lot of this info has never been super accessible before, and several of the people that I spoke to about this con were excited to see me working on this video because they just had no idea what happened to it. But voila, now you know what happened! <laughs> to be totally honest with you, I'm not really sure how to close a video like this off, so, uh... Behold, some old IzumiCon programs and promo cards. So have you played the house in Fata Morgana yet? Because if you haven't, you should play the house in Fata Morgana.